So that's my little story, and this is what the title of our presentation is, What Can CO2 Do For You? So at the end of the day, we want to know what it does for us. I can tell you what it's going to do for the patient, but what's it going to do for, what's it going to do for us? How is it going to bring value to how we do our care? Okay. So first question, capnography is only an ALS skill. True or false? Everybody have time to answer? Okay, 100% say false. Oh, 92%. Get a few more seconds. Okay, so overwhelmingly false. False is the answer. Okay, there is no discrepancy between what is an ALS skill and what is a BLS skill with capnography. Okay, the state doesn't recognize it as being one, one being ALS versus BLS. In other words, BLS people can do it. It doesn't say there's a higher level. So like when BLS people do 12 leads, can you interpret 12 leads? No, you can't. You can only send them in, right? The state doesn't uh, separate that. It doesn't say that you as a BLS provider cannot utilize this skill and interpret this stuff and apply it towards your patient care, okay? So on the uh, top right, that is a nasal filter line for an adult. There is a scoop and there's also the nasal prongs. The oxygen does not come out of those nasal prongs. The uh, carbon dioxide is pulled in through those two prongs and then also through the scoop. So if you're a mouth breather, it's sensing the end, end, uh, exhalation through the mouth. Otherwise, if you're breathing through the nose, it's going through those prongs. So the oxygen actually comes out in little holes right on your upper lip there. Okay, so you actually breathe in ambient air. If you're giving six, six liters of oxygen, it sounds like it's blasting out people's nose, but it's not. It's just going in an ambient air right here. So six liters will get you roughly five liters of oxygen inhaled, okay? Lower right, same thing, but for pediatrics, okay? Peds have a lower tidal volume, so therefore the scoop is made a little bit differently. Upper left, hopefully most of us understand what that is. That's for our uh, intubated, or what I like to say also for bag valve masks, okay? I recommend it with a bag valve mask because there's nothing better than knowing that your respirations are getting in the right spot, plain and simple, okay? Lower left, 4.5 tubes and below, that's for neonates. There's a little spring-loaded device because there's so much dead space uh, for little neonates. Just in that device alone, they put a little spring on there to help adjust the readings, okay? And in the background, there's all kinds of algorithms and everything else that helps clean up the information that's coming in to your monitor that makes it look nice and clean and pretty, and that's microstream technology. So it takes little bits and tiny bits of carbon dioxide and senses it to give you a nice clean reading, okay? So how often do you personally use capnography? Okay, not uncommon, not uncommon. If you, um, if you saw us in Perrysburg, at least nobody said, what is this capnography thing you speak of? That's pretty good. Um, in, in Perrysburg, it's a ton because about seven years ago, we saw the value in it so much and we did have uh, some people in, in higher positions of authority that were becoming obstructions to our progress, okay? So we decided that we were gonna pull the cannulas completely, regular cannulas off the trucks because we saw so much value that we wanted to see this as a vital sign. And that's what it is for us in our protocols now, it's a vital sign. So every patient that we would even put a pulse ox on, uh, obviously if we think someone's completely BS, we don't necessarily do it, but we wanna know that value. And that's when I got to the point where I realized it was so important because I was looking at patient care reports, doing my QC and my QI and stuff, and I needed to know that number because I knew how valuable it was and we weren't doing it, okay? We had buy-in from about a third of our department or so, but we just had a little bit of trouble getting us over the edge. So that's why I made that decision. And even when I was gone one day on my Kelly day or vacation, the guys on my shift, we had 100% buy-in on our shift and they said, hey, we're, um, we're ready to do this. You ready to do it? Yeah. So they, they pulled off all the cannulas when I was gone because there was that buy-in. We just need a little bit extra push over the edge, okay? But it's, it's helped us tremendously, and I can speak uh, purely from my own experience. Um, my, my level of care has gone through the roof. I really do feel that, and I feel like it's catapulted me to being such a better provider. I love that. But every time I watch that video, I get so, like, I don't know, I just kind of get chills about it. And, um, you know, obviously, it's, if you think about, no, no matter how long you've been on in the business, um, 
especially you, you that or some of you that are new, you probably have that feeling when you're first going on a call that you've never been on before or you've never seen anything before. If you can think back to your first day going out on a medic unit or going out on a fire truck, think about that feeling that you had and, and how maybe, at least for me I know it was, related to how that girl fell at the top. And then once you get down the hill, once you have that first experience or two, you start getting more and more comfortable, right? And that's the way the subject matter is, okay? It's difficult to learn sometimes. It might make us feel a little uncomfortable because it puts us out of, pushes out of our boundaries, what our norm is. But when you get to the other side, you realize how much better it made you in the end. Okay, so we have advances in care. We have advances in equipment. Are we utilizing it? Are we providing the best care? Are we doing enough? Okay, we should always ask ourselves that. That should be a continuous thing in our journey through this line of work, okay? Or no matter what else we do. We should always be asking ourselves, can we do better? If we, if we stop asking those questions, then we're, we're doing ourselves a disservice and ultimately our, our customers. So we don't rise to our level of expectations, we fall to the level of training, okay? So thank you for being here. Yep. Darn Perrysburg Township. It's a good thing we're recording, though. Now I can't you probably still can if you watch your phone. So we fall to the level of our training, okay? We're only as good as the level of our training and what we, how we, how we uh, approach that training. Capnography, it's a vital sign, I already mentioned that. There's three things you wanna think of. This is the most important slide you're gonna to see today, okay? It's a very simple slide. Three things, ventilation, perfusion, metabolism, okay? Whenever we go through any of the cases today, if you ever get stuck or you're trying to think your way through something or when you're out on that truck and you're applying this, ventilation, perfusion, metabolism. You have to think about what's going on with the patient, okay? This tool is not gonna just tell you everything. You have to think your way through it. That's a good thing because we're critically thinking and we're, we're applying physiology to this tool, okay? So the basics, obviously lead two up above, we have an EKG, then we have a pulse ox plus, and down below, you can see in the very beginning, we have a box-like shape. That's our end tidal waveform, but then we have a flat line. If that was an EKG and we saw a flat line, would that be good or bad? That'd be bad. A flat line is bad too, okay? Is that your mutual aid? Okay, so the flat line is a bad thing, right? In this case, the pulse ox is still continuing. Looks like it's a pretty good tracing. The EKG is still continuing, but somebody stopped breathing, okay? It takes it can take up to two minutes for a pulse ox, pulse ox to recognize that a patient doesn't have a pulse or the oxygen saturation is decreasing, okay? A lot of people utilize uh, the pulse ox as a way to monitor ventilation, okay? A pulse ox does not monitor ventilation, it monitors oxygenation, okay? And it's very important, okay? They're kind of like the yin and the yang. Capnography and pulse ox is a yin and a yang, okay? So you gotta have both. Or something that's uh, really confusing when you're brand new, and it took a long time for me to understand this, but it's actually rather simple. VQ ratio. V stands for ventilation. Q stands for perfusion. Some cardiologists made that up. Why it's a Q, I don't know. If anybody knows, let me know. But for every time we breathe in four liters a minute, we circulate five liters of blood. Okay? So we have something called a normal VQ ratio. It's point. 0.8, okay? That's not on the test later, but a normal VQ ratio is that balance, okay? If we start breathing really fast, we can create an imbalance, okay? And we can cause a VQ mismatch. So if we breathe really fast or our perfusion gets really low because of a bad heart rate, a dysfunctioning heart, someone's bleeding out, someone's really dehydrated, we can cause a problem there. COPD, some kind of difficulty breathing, we can call it, cause a VQ mismatch. We always have to think about what's going on with that patient, physiologically speaking, okay, in relationship to a VQ mismatch. 
this is a huge thing that will make a huge difference in how you uh, assess and treat your patients from this point forward. So waveform comprehension. Now we have most people answered that they have little experience with capnography. Uh, for the little experience that you do have, do you know what a normal waveform looks like? Sir? Uh, like a plateau. And I always say box-like shape, okay? So I'm going to draw my little iPad here. And we got an upstroke. And then it goes slightly up, not much at all. And it goes down, okay? That's a relatively normal waveform. You got a flat baseline on the bottom, okay, right here. And then when you start breathing out, so this right here, I actually like to come from back here. So let's go here first, okay? This is when you start breathing in. So everybody breathe in. Hold it. Here's your flat line. That's you're holding your breath in. Now exhale. That's your end exhalation right there where that red dot is, okay? So when you first start breathing out and exhaling, it's right here. Now, right here, where is that air in your airway in the bottom? Think about it for a second. Is that air closer to your mouth or further away from your mouth? Think about it. Yep, it's closer. Okay, and I'm just trying to make you think here because that's what I like to do. So this is closer, and if you think about it, this is a lower number, right? Our normal end tidal, end tidal is this, this highest point right here, okay? End tidal CO2. Our normal end tidal rating should be around 35 to 45 millimeters of mercury, okay? So when we first start breathing out, if you think about it, we have some dead space in our trachea and stuff like that. We're not exchanging gas with our lungs. So we're always recycling a little bit of carbon dioxide back and forth when we're breathing in and out. Okay, much the same, we always have some dead space down here when we're breathing out, exhaling, we're not getting all the air out, right? So we're constantly recycling a little bit here or there. So when we first breathe out, we're breathing out a little bit of carbon dioxide, but as, as we get deeper and deeper from the lungs, we get a higher and higher amount, okay? Normal spot where we have gas exchange, the best sweet spot of gas exchange is kind of like the middle third of the lungs, okay? So middle third of lungs is really an ideal spot where you have good blood, blood uh, movement and uh, exchange with the alveoli, but it's also a really good spot where you have optimal gas exchange when someone's ventilating on their own or you're ventilating for them, okay? So that is a normal waveform, box-like shape. And then another thing you want to think about is this right here. This is called an alpha angle, okay? Whenever you're interpreting a waveform, you want to, one, look to see if there's a box-like shape. So is it normal or abnormal? If you don't see a box-like shape, it's automatically abnormal, and you got to figure out why. It could be because somebody's coughing. It could be because somebody's talking. Or it could be because there's a physiologic abnormality. Okay? Your main abnormality is a bronchospasm. How many people have heard of a bronchospasm waveform before? Okay. How many people have listened to lung sounds and not known for sure what they were hearing. I'm right there, okay. Um, or how many times have you been convinced you heard what you thought you heard and you were wrong? Okay. This is where there's a huge value in this because this is a diagnostic thing, okay. Um, and we're going to go a lot into that tonight and how we can bring value to this with our respiratory distress patients, okay. So a bronchospasm waveform. If someone's having an asthma attack or a COPD attack, what do they usually have in their lungs? What's the sound? What, what do you usually hear? Wheezing. And what are the wheezes in those types of patients? Like, what is it an inspiratory wheeze or is it an expiratory wheeze, typically? Yeah, typically an expiratory wheeze, okay? So if we have an expiratory wheeze, we're going to have a delay in exhalation, right? So if we have a delay in exhalation, then as time goes on, well, initially, I might have a little bit of rounding of this alpha angle, okay? Do you see the difference between that box-like shape now? So early on an asthma attack, CLPD attack, if that's truly what it is going on, okay, you might have a little bit of that rounding of that alpha angle, okay? And they might be breathing a little fast. They might be a little anxious. As time goes on and they get worse and worse, 
then your alpha angle gets worse and worse. And maybe your end tidal CO2 is getting higher and higher. Okay. Why would your end tidal CO2 be getting higher and higher with a bronchospasm waveform or a patient that's having an asthma attack? Any ideas? Kind of. Close. Any, I heard someone else getting ready to speak up. Don't be afraid. Don't be bashful. Yeah, because remember, we're having expiratory wheezes, right? So what's happening? As time is going on and things are getting worse and worse, things are starting to clamp down. It's starting to get restricted. And so the biggest thing with these patients is that they are suffocating to death, okay? They can't get air out. They can get air in a lot of times. Uh, as time goes on, that, that, that changes. But initially on, they're getting air in. They just are having trouble getting air out, okay? So as time goes on, it gets worse and worse and worse. I use my purple color now. And then it, now, do you see the shark fin now? Okay, that's what, that's what traditionally we're taught. That's what I was taught initially. But that's, that's really far into it, and that's when things start getting really bad, and that's when you need to be really aggressive when you start seeing a shark fin like that. Okay, so it might be very mild. It might be very profound. The other thing you want to remember, too, is when you're looking at your monitor on the screen, the monitor on the screen is condensed in time. Sometimes it's difficult to see what you have. When we do an EKG, do we print? Do we push print? Are we taught to push print? When I was new, we didn't have computers and stuff to transfer runs to and all that. We always push print. When we want to read an EKG or a 12 lead, do we still let it print out and read it? Okay, same thing here. We want to print out, and what we'll find on, on a strip is that we're, because the respiratory rate is much slower, typically, than a pulse rate, we're going to have to print out a long piece just to see one or two waveforms. Okay, so we can glance at it on a screen and get an idea, but really you need to print it out to have a decent idea of what we're looking at. And sometimes the bronchospasm on the printout does not look as profound as what it does on the screen. Okay, so what we're going to see tonight is a lot of those different ones on the screen. All right, any questions there? Can we see the same thing with people who have like pneumonia and crackles and everything? Yes, so uh, you won't necessarily see a bronchospasm. Right? I think of, number one, I think of bronchospasm as delayed exhalation, okay? Because just because you see a bronchospasm waveform doesn't necessarily mean that it's that. Let's say you have an unconscious person. Their tongue's falling to the back of the throat. You might see that delayed exhalation because their tongue is obstructing their airway, okay? With a pneumonia patient, I have some very good cases to show you later on, okay? Um, without getting too much into it in a moment, you may have a decreased waveform, but it may be normal looking or it may look really crummy. The reason it would look really crummy and not perfectly clean, you won't see that bronchospasm for sure, okay? Unless you have a couple things going on, but typically you don't in those cases. Uh, you'll have a kind of a crummy looking waveform. It might be a little bit decreased because you have bad gas exchange, okay? And a lot of times what will happen, like we'll still give nebulizer treatments to those people that we suspect are pneumonia because they have a really low pulse ox. That'll be the other thing you wanna look for. Do they have a low pulse ox? Do you have a good pleth on your pulse ox? If you do have that, most likely you should be eyeing in on the lung sounds a little bit better and utilizing this, and it'll help you differentiate a little bit more. Nine times out of 10, there's gotta be pneumonia if your pulse ox is low for no good reason and you got a good pleth, okay? In other words, they're not shocky. It's gotta be something along that lines. But you'll have a decreased waveform because of gas exchange, and a lot of times those pneumonia people, they have other uh, problems going on, such as dehydration and so on and so forth. Answer your question for now? Yeah. Okay, cool. We'll see if you get it right later on. So we evaluate the waveform. We evaluate the numbers. We decide is the number low, high, or normal. And what's normal for us again? 35 to 45. And that, that is consistent with us right now breathing normally. That's consistent um, in our bloodstream. If we take our arterial CO2, we're within five points. We're going to be roughly five points lower than what we're breathing out. So if I'm breathing out 40, my arterial CO2, if, just as long as everything's going well for us, we're in homeostasis, it'll be five points less. If we think about it, if I'm running a garden hose or a fire hose, I'm using pressure to push that water out, right? The higher pressure is at the pump, right? The lower pressure is at the end of the hose where it's spraying out, okay? So everything, including things that go on in our body, 
moves from high pressure to low pressure. Okay, what we're measuring is pressure. Okay, essentially that's what we're measuring. So it makes sense that in order for carbon dioxide to offload, you need a lower pressure on the alveoli side of the lung. Okay, so that's why that number is slightly lower. Now, if you got a really sick person, they get a VQ mismatch. That whole philosophy is out the window. And when I first started doing this, I was thinking, well, shit, what good is this for me? But the more I thought about it, and the more I learned, and as I said, I'm self-taught because there's barely anybody teaching this subject, barely anybody, okay? The more I thought about it, I was like, wait a minute. This makes sense. I can use this to my advantage and how I treat my patient. Just as long as I remember, there's probably a VQ mismatch, okay? Number, uh, number four, there, number five? Evaluate the trends. So once we evaluate the waveform, we evaluate the numbers, we're saying, okay, is it high or low? Is there a VQ mismatch likely? Then we want to evaluate those trends. Are things getting better for the patient or are they getting worse? You're already doing that now with other things that you do, right? You're using that in your assessment. So we're just incorporating this into our patient assessment. Are this a patient getting better? And now we can measure it in another fashion, especially when we have that respiratory patient, okay? We have that respiratory patient that's wheezing, is their bronchospasm getting better? Is their end tidal rising? Is their work of breathing getting better? Is it getting better because they're starting to fade, because they're starting to struggle? Our pulse ox might still be 100%, but what's their respiratory effort? Are their wheezes clearing up? We can tell by our bronchospasm. That's diagnostic, just like a 12 lead. By the way, this is like, when I first came into this business 20 years ago, I was like the first class ever to do 12 leads. Um, and so for me, that was really cool, but I had a lot of people that have been around for a while that didn't know how to do 12 leads when I first came out of medic school, okay? This, for you new people, this is your 12 lead right here, okay? This is, this is the, the, the best thing since 12 lead EKGs came out in our line of work. All right, so waveform interpretation. This is the way I'm gonna do this thing. I typed in normal. It must not have cleared out when I was testing this. The next slide we look at I'm going to go to the next slide, but on your phone, you're still going to see this slide. Make sense? So here's your waveform interpretation, and then we'll jump back to see what you guys think. Now, just because I put normal doesn't mean it's normal, okay? I was just testing, so that's not a giveaway. So don't answer normal. Well, I'm not going to tell you not to answer normal, but don't do whatever that says. Here you go. Now, this, is, this may trip you up slightly, and let me explain normal, okay? There's definitely some abnormality here, abnormality, but first thing, is it normal box-like shape? So that's what I would say is a normal waveform, okay? So is it a normal waveform? So put normal or abnormal, and then you're going to do a comma, and then you're going to tell me what do you think is else is going on or what else do you see, okay? Now I want to point out, too, on the right-hand side, you see your numbers on the graph. Okay, so that tells you for the top one, let's look at the top one only, okay? Top one only. Okay, you guys ready? Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, abnormal, low end tidal CO2, not normal, abnormal, hyperventilating, not normal, low, abnormal, breathing fast. Abnormal. Okay. Normal. Abnormal airway restriction. Okay. Abnormal not sure. Woo, we're getting some more and more answers. Okay. So we got the picture here. Abnormal. All right. So let's take a quick look at it. Uh, a lot of stuff going on here. Number one is, if I'm looking for a normal waveform, remember, I want to look for a normal box-like shape. That's normal for me, a normal waveform. First thing we have to identify, is there a bronchospasm going on? Is there something else going on? Now, when you actually start doing this, it's going to be very rare that you're going to see like a completely perfect box-like shape, okay? Just because of how people breathe and, and normal respiratory patterns. So if we look at this pretty close, we can see there are some abnormal waveforms here, okay? And the thing I want to point out to you is like this one here. It looks like that could be a bronchospasm, right? Problem is, that's about the only one there, okay? Most of the rest of them I'm going to classify as box-like shape 
with the exception that some of these really short ones here, they're kind of rounded, right? We don't want to get too caught up in looking for a bronchospasm if it isn't there. So in other words, a true bronchospasm, a true asthma attack, is going to be very consistent with shark fin type waveforms or bronchoconstriction waveforms. Does that make sense? Okay. So what we do have here is a very fast respiratory rate. And if you look, if you look at it based over the course of time, you can see that there's different lengths of exhalation, right? Do we agree? Like we're not breathing a perfectly good pattern. So they're breathing really fast, and this is like a little bit over 10 second strip, so they're breathing like at least 40 times a minute. I'm not gonna count, okay? And then if we look at our numbers on the side, look at that red line in the middle. We got 35. Remember we said 35 is our normal number, okay? So we definitely know it's low. So we got a low end tidal CO2. They're breathing really, really fast. This is a patient that is a typical hyperventilation syndrome, okay? so. They're breathing really, really fast. And of course they're breathing so fast, they're blowing off way too much CO2. So their numbers are going down and down and down, okay? We also worked with this patient at the doctor's office and coached them back. And then we signed them off with the normal waveform. So we actually used the monitor on the screen and coached them through the process of slowing their breathing down. And as they controlled their breathing and slowed down, taking shorter breaths and kind of holding their breaths in, they coached themselves and brought their own levels back up. Okay, sometimes they go for too long and it's very difficult to get them back up because it turns into a metabolic problem. Does that one make a little bit of sense? Okay, so let's go to the next one. Okay, here's our next waveform interpretation. Now your middle line, the middle thick line, that's your 35 on this one, since I don't have the graph on the side. So the same thing, is it normal or abnormal? Is a box-like shape? If it's not box-like shape, it's abnormal. And if it's abnormal, What's wrong with it? Uh, you can look at any one of these, but we'll always start with the top. Yep. They are all along the same lines, just different rates and things like that. So these are the same. The top two are the same patient. The bottom one is a different patient. Okay. Okay, five, four, three, two, one. I'm going to switch over. Ooh, we got a different screen. You might be able to see each other's answers this time too. So if you see somebody else answer something that pops up on your screen, you can pick theirs too instead of typing your own. Okay, so I see abnormal, abnormal hyperventilation, normal, real low, slightly abnormal, abnormal asthma attack, abnormal COPD. Okay, so we mostly are seeing abnormal we have one normal, okay? Okay, good, let's move on. So, the first thing I wanna look here is, is there a box-like shape? Well, number one is, this is my baseline at the bottom of the strip. I can see that at, at inhalation, I'm not getting all the way down to the baseline, okay? Number one. Number two, if I wanted to see a box-like shape, I would expect it more like that, okay? So notice that this is low to begin with, and then that alpha angle is definitely sloping, okay? We're kind of like going up on a hill there, okay? So this is an abnormal waveform, and this would be classified as a decent bronchospasm. Because remember I said it's over the course of time on a printout, it doesn't look as drastic, okay? These uh, top two are the same patient. This is a patient that was having an asthma attack, uh, was freaking out because they're also allergic to like shellfish or something. Okay, so they were having an asthma attack, but they were also having an allergic reaction. And um, that's partly the reason why the level is lower, even though she has a bronchospasm. Okay, so she had two things going on. She had a little bit of a wheezing going on, which not all allergic reactions will have wheezing. Okay, so you might have a normal waveform with allergic reaction. They might be complaining of difficulty breathing, but it may be a normal waveform. They're having difficulty breathing because they're third spacing and they're going into shock. Okay. So in this case, she does have some wheezing. And then she's, she's recirculating some of that carbon dioxide because she's trapping air. So then remember that baseline that I mentioned? That baseline is slightly off the bottom. So she's, she's recirculating carbon dioxide, extra carbon dioxide, and she's not getting a full inhalation or exhalation. Okay. So 
She was a little bit shocky, so she had a bit of a VQ mismatch with respiratory, but also a VQ mismatch with her perfusion. And when someone has poor perfusion with regards, to, in this case, an allergic reaction, it's distributive shock, okay? So she had less blood returning back to the heart, and then therefore the heart returning to the right side, of the blood returning to the right side of the heart was decreased going to the lungs. So therefore she was dropping off less carbon dioxide to her lungs, which means she was exhaling less carbon dioxide. Does that make sense? That's going to be a big thing here when we go through some more cases. Okay, let's go to the next one. Okay, let's concentrate on the top two. Abnormal or normal? This is almost a gimme, right? All right, I'm going to switch back to their screen. Okay, someone says asthma attack. I would agree with that. Asthma attack, abnormal. Shark fin for sure. Okay, good. So that one's much more profound, right? That's bad news bears right there is what that is, okay? That's when you got to be really aggressive in your treatments and uh, pulling out all the stops on that type of patient. Um... I'm trying to remember which patient this was. There's so many cases in here. But the end of the day is uniformity, okay? Do you guys see the same waveform over and over and over again? Over and over, okay? You, you have that delayed exhalation. That is a dead giveaway for some type of bronchoconstriction, okay? So if I'm looking really hard for a bronchospasm waveform, but I only see one out of seven, that's not a bronchospasm waveform, okay? That's going to lead me down the wrong path. But when I see this, now this is good. This is differential diagnosis for me, okay? This confirms either what I'm thinking or it's going to send me down a different path and, and allow me to uh, focus in on what's really going on, okay? What about this bottom one, though? Um, doesn't look as bad as the ones on top, does it? This patient has a really fast respiratory rate. For the most part, those waveforms are uniform, and if you look at that front alpha angle, it definitely is rounding and it's consistent, okay? So it's not always easy. There's going to be tough ones, and I remember this guy. We had a really tough time with this guy, and this was many years ago. Um, and he could have had a mixed thing going on. He could have had some type of COPD, but also had something else going on also, okay? I'm not sure what happened to that guy, but he was in some bad shape. Notice, though, he's breathing really, really fast. If this was a true bronchospasm and only a bronchospasm type event and he's in that much distress, that tells me there's something else going on because think about it. If someone is in having an asthma attack and they're starting to have more and more restriction trying to breathe out, is their respiratory rate going to stay high when it's really, really severe? No, it's going to be delayed, right? Okay, let's take a five-minute break. All right, so I think we have mostly everybody back and we'll get started again to keep things moving along. So I'm spending a little bit extra time, even though maybe it's getting a little uh, tiring to look at a uh, screen and waveforms. We're going to get into more critical thinking stuff, but I wouldn't leave anybody behind. Number one is, uh, like I said, I had to teach myself all this stuff. What you're seeing is my experience, okay? A lot of this stuff, most of it is from years ago when I first started doing this stuff, okay? So this is really literally me unfolding the things that happened in front of me and most of the cases that I've seen myself and how I've evolved and learned and been able to help you guys kind of catapult yourselves a little bit further ahead, okay? It took me a long time to teach myself. I want to be able to make this stuff easy to learn and easy to apply, okay? So once again, any questions, please don't hesitate to ask. But two, we're spending a little bit extra time on this just for that reason. I want to leave anybody behind. And three, that's why we're recording it, all right? So this one, I'm not going to do the poll. We're just going to look at this real quick since we're uh, uh, doing pretty decent on time. Uh, this patient was a patient, this is tells you how long ago it was, was an asthma attack patient, okay? So you obviously can see the bronchospasm. You can see he's struggling to exhale. You can see the baseline is slightly above the normal zero, okay? So a lot of things we're already talking about. You can also see the initial waveform analysis, that top line, it's a pretty bad bronchospasm. Well, back then, we didn't have CPAP, which you guys have CPAP and nebulizers here for that, right? 
Back then we didn't have that. We only had CPAP or CHF. This is how long ago it was. Uh, we're given a nebulizer treatment and he's doing okay, but not doing great. And then the waveform progression, would you say the waveform has gotten any better from the first to the second one? No, no. Would you say maybe it's getting a little worse? It's hard to tell, but it probably looks like it's getting a little bit worse. But also look at, uh, look at their, uh, his number to begin with on a top one. He's a little bit over 35. We'll say he was like at 37, 38. Okay. And if you look a little bit closer at the second one and definitely going into the third one, what do you see happening along with maybe a worsening bronchospasm? What's his number? It's going up. Why would it be going up? Yeah, he's retaining. Okay. So by, by sure necessity, he's going into respiratory failure. And whenever we see a bronchospasm waveform or any waveform for that, num for that matter, we can always assume, just based on that basic physiology, that our carbon dioxide level has to be higher in the blood. Okay? Now, when we're restricting air and we're having trouble getting air out, you better believe that that five-point difference that we normally expect is going to be a hell of a lot more of a disparity in our bloodstream. So if we're seeing uh, 60, let's say, on that number below, you better believe that he's probably at 70, maybe 80 in his bloodstream. Okay? The classification for respiratory failure, uh, where you're retaining carbon dioxide, is 50. Okay, so you can you can best believe if you see 50 on your end title on the screen, you can best believe they're well in advanced in the respiratory failure. So now, if I had this patient nowadays and I saw this, I'd be immediately hitting him with a nebulizer treatment and CPAP. Okay, five centimeters of water. I'm probably going to consider giving an epi drip. Okay, or, or even a sub-Q epi, or IM epi, okay, and I'm going to hit him with a mag sulfate. You guys do mag sulfate here? Yeah, okay. So mag sulfate, there's just a recent study coming out that says the sooner you hit mag sulfate on a severe asthmatic, the sooner you get it into them, the better chance they have of not being admitted, okay? So some people are a little gun-shy to give mag because it's so far down the line. There's evidence showing that the sooner you give it with justification, okay, the sooner you give it, the better off that patient's going to be, okay? So in this case, the guy rips off his nebulizer mask and says, I can't breathe. Is that a good sign or a bad sign? He's, he's now, he's, he's, he's so freaking scared, he's ripping the mask off because he can't breathe, okay? Our choices back then wasn't many. Back then, it's like you might have to tube them, but now you got to fight them, and they're going to try to ventilate them. You're going to try to breathe for them. We didn't have much sedation back then. We have more tools, so screw it. We're just going to grab our CPAP and put them on them and see what happens because we were, we were in that transition of getting ready to move to the CPAP, but we weren't there. Our CPAP actually provided uh, 10 centimeters of water because it was strictly used for CHF. That was the only setting we had. Okay? We popped it on. He loved it. We couldn't give him an embolizer treatment um, I think maybe they gave a mag on the way in. I can't remember. They should have, especially based on the recent studies. Okay, um, and even then, I think I would say that we were gun shy in doing some of this stuff. But he loved the CPAP because it's splitting them open. Okay, the nebulizer treatments, unfortunately, we couldn't do it, uh, especially with 10 centimeters of water. It's just not. It's not going to work. It's going to blast right through. So, I don't know what happened to him, but he made it to the hospital and he was stabilized at least to a certain extent. Okay, we definitely did not improve the situation, but at least it didn't get any worse because that guy was about to buy a tube, go into respiratory arrest, yada, yada, yada. Okay. Okay, let's look at the next interpretation. Oh, this is a tough one. Okay, I only give you a little bit to begin with. Okay, the first one doesn't count because that's right when we hooked it up, so it's a partial breath. Go to the next three. Would you say they're normal or abnormal? This is kind of a trick question. Okay, because it's not always easy, right? You got to use the law of averages. You're looking at all three. You're not just looking at one. Okay. Everybody get a good glance at it. Okay. I'm going to switch back. All right. So normal-ish, abnormal. So we have mostly normal. And that would be what I would say too, mostly normal. Okay. At the end of the day, it's normal. 
The reason the end of day it's normal is because this is a respiratory distress patient. They're sitting on this, this uh, bigger lady, not huge, but bigger, sitting on her steps inside the house of a tri-level house. And she's sitting there in a tripod position. And she's like, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. And she's breathing really fast. And we're already suspecting something going on. What would you be suspecting with that type of patient? She's big and chubby. There's a few things that can be going on, right? We could be CHF, COPD, which she doesn't have a history of. Next thing I'm thinking of is CHF, okay? So we're suspecting CHF, but the first thing we want to do is get a cannula on before we apply CPAP. Why would I want to put a cannula on and get an interpretation before I put CPAP on? Any questions, any ideas? Baseline, yeah, exactly. I want to know what the baseline is so when I put the CPAP on, whether or not I get them a change or an improvement. If I don't put it on before I put the CPAP on, I could skew my interpretation. So, by the way, some of those uh, aberrations, especially that third waveform there, that's just her probably talking or guppy breathing or something strange, right? So it's not always gonna be clean, but the first two are clean enough for me. Okay, that's a pretty decent waveform. Notice it's relatively normal. It's, a, on a, it's like 36, 37 as far as uh, numbers go. So that's, that's good enough for me, right? But she's breathing really fast. So she's breathing really fast for a 36, 37 waveform. If someone's hyperventilating like that first slide we showed, she was breathing like 40 times a minute, right? And they were hyperventilating and that number was dropping, right? Remember that slide? That was our very first one. Okay, this lady's breathing really, really fast. Uh, each one of those lines, vertical lines, is the thick ones is, is a second. So we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And we have one, two, three, four, five, six, six times ten. Sixty. Okay, so she's breathing really fast, put it in perspective. Okay. Why would she be breathing so fast and have a normal end title? She doesn't have a bronchospasm. Well, if she was having a panic attack, wouldn't her end title be really low, like a hyperventilation? So she'd be breathing off a ton of carbon dioxide. What's that? It could be something else going on, right? Because we've got to think about ventilation, perfusion, metabolism. Okay? All three of those things could affect us. So uh, the second, this second waveform here is when we put the CPAP on. Is the waveform as clean as before? For the most part, it is. But if you want to argue it a little bit, you can say that there's some inconsistencies. If you look at the first waveform, it almost looks like a bronchospasm. The second one uh, looks halfway decent, but there's not much of a plateau. The third one almost looks like a bronchospasm. And then the other ones are pretty decent. They're more box-like shape. Okay? Compared to the other one, it's a little bit different. That's why you need to put on the cannula first, get a baseline assessment. And literally for us, it was three, four breaths. And boom, the CPAP was ready. We're working as a team. Someone's getting the CPAP out because we know the direction we're going, but we want to get some confirmation, make sure we're going down the right path. This is very important. As time goes on, the patient starts stabilizing a little bit. Does that waveform look really pretty now? All that was was CPAP and nitro. And obviously, we did all of our other stuff that we were doing, right? We're taking a pulse ox. We're doing an EKG. We're doing a 12 lead. Um, um, whatever else I'm missing, sorry, Bart. but we're doing everything, right? And so we're treating our patient, we're incorporating this into our assessment, and we're strictly confirming what we're already suspecting in this case, okay? Sometimes it helps us get to the, get to the bottom of things when we're not really sure, okay? So this lady did very well, and we got her to the hospital. Blood pressure was sky high, I imagine, on this one. Okay. I uh, omitted some of the vital signs just to move along. But you can imagine with CHF, typically, do you usually see, like, Left side heart failure, do you usually see a high blood pressure? That's almost always what I'm looking for. The problem is blood pressure can lead you down a very wrong path if you're looking just at blood pressure with respiratory distress. Okay. Now, in this case, I mentioned and you, you, you attempted to answer, does this lady have such a high respiratory rate but have a relatively normal end title? The answer is, The blood can't pump forward, right? And the left side of the heart pumps blood to our body. Okay. Blood backing up from the left side of the heart, and it's filling up in the lungs. Agree? Okay. So we can't get forward blood flow. What's hence is why we give nitro and pro and all that other stuff, because we want to 
vasodilate to allow that forward blood flow to go forward, okay, instead of backing up. That's also why we give CPAP. We want to increase the pressure over here to create a down gradient pressure downstream. Does that make sense? So this lady has a bunch of blood backing up in her lungs, and she's breathing really, really fast. Uh, we remember we're circulating a certain amount of carbon dioxide, a certain amount of oxygen, and other things in our bloodstream all the time. When we, breathe, when we exhale carbon dioxide, are we dropping off 100% of the carbon dioxide in our bloodstream? No, we always have a recirculating volume, right? Same thing with oxygen. Are we, when we breathe in, are our cells using up all the oxygen in our bloodstream? No. So we're always going to have a, a higher amount of oxygen. We're always going to have a higher amount of carbon dioxide in our bloodstream and then a lower amount without. Remember the high pressure, low pressure? Well, in the case of carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide goes through our uh, fluid in our lungs um, perfectly normal. It can't be blocked by fluid such as in CHF. Okay, so she's breathing really, really fast because blood's backing up in the lungs. We're going to have a really high carbon dioxide level or a suspected high carbon dioxide level because it's not moving forward and it's not circulating. So all that blood and all that carbon dioxide that would normally be circulating in our bloodstream, it's now in the lungs. She's breathing really, really fast. It looks normal because she's keeping it normal. Okay, as soon as she stops breathing, it's going to build up really, really quick. Okay. Does that make sense? That's going to be a key thing when you're trying to differentiate between that patient that you just can't quite tell what the hell is going on, and you can't really tell what's going on in their lungs. Lung sounds are very subjective, okay? So we need to use the craft with this and listening to lung sounds and kind of using our spidey senses to come up with a solution. Every CHF, every left side of heart failure I've seen has had a high respiratory rate because that's the nature of the beast, and they've had a relatively normal end tidal CO2. Every one of them. Okay, so keep that in the back of your mind when we look at some other cases. How about this one? So this question is, we all know this is abnormal, right? What do you not see? What do you not see? And what do you see that is not normal other than then we know the waveform is not normal. But what's missing? And then what's present that should not be there? This is a great one. <laughs> okay, you guys ready? I'm going to go back. Yeah, normal, huh? Plateau. We're missing a plateau. Okay. Abnormal high. Not returning to baseline. Very good. No bottom baseline. Very good. Elevated baseline. I'm liking it, guys. Retaining CO2, which is the same thing as abnormal baseline. Okay. We know it's abnormal. Good. All right. So we don't have a plateau. Why don't we have a plateau? Think about it physiologically. If that person's breathing out and we want to get to a plateau, if we don't have it, what's missing? Well, they're definitely breathing fast. And they could be hyperventilating. But there's something more going on with this patient. This was a difficulty breathing patient. History of COPD and CHF. Found in a bent over position holding ankles because she says it helps her breathe better. So picture that in your mind. Notation of the narrative report was wheezing. Treated with aerosols by nebulizer. Okay. So you're Monday morning, Monday morning quarterbacking. Do you see a bronchospasm? Don't look too hard. Do you see a nice upstroke in the beginning? Right? The alpha angle is there, but there's not much of a plateau. So the plateau can, that can send you down the wrong path. Uh, this person that was a paramedic was very resistant to learning and didn't utilize the technology that he actually did plug in because it was mandatory, but he didn't utilize it in his assessment. So he continued to give nebulizer treatment. There was no change. Would you agree that there's no change in the waveform okay, or the course of treatment? So I've seen other patients like this before. They're not getting to end exhalation. Okay, now let's think about it. 
Remember, our end tidal CO2 is coming from the lower part of our lungs, right? So when we breathe out, she's not getting that best ideal gas exchange area. She's not exhaling all the way. There's something keeping her from getting to end exhalation. What could that be? It could be because her lungs are so full of fluid, okay? And the other thing that I've seen or suspect I've seen, okay, is collapsed alveoli. If we have a patient that has atelectasis, okay, we have fluid, fluid around the lungs, not CHF fluid, but we have like fluid around the lungs that causes, causes those alveoli to collapse, okay? We may not get good gas exchange, and we may not get our end exhalation, okay? I've had other patients where we put CPAP on just like this, boom, beautiful square waveform. So what changed? We gave a little bit of pressure, we expanded the alveoli, and now we have beautiful gas exchange. The, the baseline will come down, and if you think about it, one is affecting the other. She's not getting end exhalation, so where, all is, it, where is all that carbon dioxide that's supposed to be coming out? It's right here in a dead space, okay? So then she's breathing it back in, and then we're producing more carbon dioxide. More is getting trapped, going back down, okay? Make sense? Um, I would not classify it as pneumonia, okay? Uh, not to say that it couldn't be there, but my two main things I would be watching for is, one, they're trapping air for some reason. That, that would be more from CHF fluid or the alveoli collapsed. Yeah, classified as 50. Yep. And by the way, um, some people will say uh, a normal baseline for, say, COPD ears, you know, they retain carbon dioxide. Um, and some people will blow off a COPD ear because their carbon dioxide level is high or they don't take it very seriously. I've seen several patients, uh, either with COPD or not COPD, complaining of difficulty breathing. Maybe they're a little goofy, okay? Their mentation is slightly off and they have an elevated carbon dioxide level. And at least one of those patients I know of, it's not my patient, but I've seen this run reporter across the desk. That patient goes to the hospital, it kind of gets blown off at the hospital, and um, that continuum of care continues, and uh, they end up going to respiratory arrest, okay? And they end up arresting at the hospital. So unfortunately, hospitals don't use this technology very well either, okay? Doctors aren't being taught this in medical school. You're gonna be some of the leaders as far as this goes and how we're gonna apply it. But an EMS drives this stuff all the time. EMS does all kinds of stuff that drives the hospitals to do stuff. How many hospitals do you see using a Lucas device? Yeah, pretty much zero. That I've, I've never seen anybody, other than us transferring care, and then they start doing a dog and pony show, you know, lining up with uh, compressions and everything else, and usually the compressions suck. They're not, they're not measuring their compressions. So, um, EMS usually drives these types of uh, technologies to make them better, all right? So nothing changed, CPAP would have worked and it would have drove down that baseline because we would have created a plateau, gas exchange would have went better, okay? All right, what's your favorite beer? I got some high class beers there. I personally cannot decide. High life. Lately, you're under 21. You're not handsome. <laughs> I was going to say, there's a lot of young faces here. Remember, this is completely anonymous, so we don't know. Unless, I mean, unless you're using your phone right now. I mean, you could be using your phone not paying attention, which is true, you know. No Schlitz. <laughs> so, uh, your name again? I'm Katie. Katie. Katie's abstaining because she thinks all this beer is crappy, which... Piss water is piss water. You take it when you get it. Yeah. I, I, I am... One that I would drink if I had. I, I like... Well, I don't like Natty Light so much. I, I drank a lot of that in college, so... I'm a big fan of Schlitz. That makes me pee a lot, though. So I, I'm, I'm, usually an I, I'm usually an IPA guy, and I love Paps. And I, I, like high, I like the High Life, too. But I like IPA. I drink anything. I drink any kind of beer. But. All right. So, ventilation. Remember, ventilation, perfusion, metabolism. 
So I'm going to skip very briefly through this, but um, in the hospitals, they should be using this when they do conscious or procedural sedation. So when we're doping somebody up on some type of medication and they have a decreased level of consciousness, this should be used. Um, and you will find that some of the doctors are using it. Unfortunately, there's not enough. Uh, there's a, um, so I'm, I'm uh, rep technically representing Medtronic today, by the way. Um, so I'm teaching for Medtronic this subject matter. Okay, there's about six of us in the country that do it. And uh, a couple years ago, I flew out to Boulder. We all met up, and there was a new guy that came from a, a neighboring department in Boulder area, and he told this story about they, they are, their fire department's in a strip mall, okay? And people come running over from the dentist's office next door, and they're freaking the hell out. They're saying, we need you over there quick, blah, blah, blah. And they get over there, and they walk into a complete shit show, okay? Walk into a complete shit show. It turns out that this dentist was doing some type of procedure had her doped up on, uh, I don't know what, more than nitrous, and he was watching her pulse ox, okay? He had a capnography machine sitting right there and he wasn't using it. Meanwhile, she stopped breathing. He didn't notice it as he's working on her, which is strange, okay? Young 22-year-old girl, bright future ahead of her. She stops breathing and he doesn't notice it until her pulse ox precipitously drops. That would have been at least two minutes gone by where something could have been done. And now, how many dentists do you know that take ECLS actually know what the hell they're doing? Years ago, I, I showed up uh, when I worked for uh, MedCor in Bowling Green. I was brand spanking new, and it was somebody else I was working with that was brand spanking new on Christmas Eve. And we show up to a car accident. We have two unconscious people, and uh, I was pissing myself, maybe shitting myself too, as well as my partner, because neither one of us knew what the hell we were doing. I'll flat out say that. And we didn't know the area. And um, a lady comes up and says, I'm a doctor. Can I help? Yes, please. Uh, what kind of doctor are you? I'm a gynecologist. Okay. Here's how you hold C-spine. Here's how you open an airway. Can you do that for me? Yes. Okay. Please do that. Okay. Oh, it works. So that was her response. Like, oh, look at that. It works, right? So they walk into a complete shit show just the same. Okay, just because someone's a doctor or a dentist or whatever else doesn't mean they know jack shit. Um, and, because they're out of their element, okay? If I want a cavity filled, that's the person I want. If I want someone around an arrest, I want the medic crew next door, which is what they did. That girl ended up dying. She had an anoxic brain injury. She had an anoxic brain injury because he didn't detect the problem right away, okay? There would have been a flat line. There would have been something there that said, something is wrong. We need to intervene now. There is no excuse in today's day and age when we have technology at our fingertips not to use it, okay? The same goes for that dentist, okay? Do you think he's going to be practicing much longer? Hell no. Don't put yourselves in that position, okay? That's why you should be using it. All kinds of research. Hypoventilation. If uh, We talked about hyperventilation earlier, right? Hyperventilation, we're breathing really flat, fast. We're, we're pushing out all kinds of carbon dioxide. If we stop breathing or we start breathing slowly, conventional wisdom would tell us that our carbon dioxide levels would. Mm -hmm. Think about it for a second. Two things that go with ventilation, tidal volume, respiratory rate. Picture your drug overdose patient. If a drug overdose patient typically will have what kind of respirations? Shallow, slow, okay? Uh, so they might have poor tidal volume and a slow respiratory rate. If I put on a bag valve mask and I put on my capnography and I start breathing for them, if I got a good open airway, I'm not gonna see too much of that sloping waveform, right? Because remember that tongue falling the back of the throat? So I'm doing a good jaw thrust. I'm doing a good mask seal with two hands and somebody else is bagging for me. I'm not trying to do it by myself like a hero, okay? Unless you have to, because there's not enough people but we're using a good mass seal, and then we're getting that carbon dioxide reading, most likely we're gonna see a high reading to begin with, okay? And we can help breathe some of that off by ventilating them appropriately. We're gonna see that reading, and we're gonna see it drop down. In this case, we get a call for a lady at a nursing home. She's uh, had a decreased level of consciousness. They can't figure out why. She's laying there in bed. She actually looks pretty decent. She's got decent color, but she's not responding. And we put her on her end title, and we got a respiratory rate that's pretty decent. Um, so relatively normal, but we got this waveform. So what could be going on with this waveform? We know it's abnormal. 
Is there a plateau? There's not much of anything, right? So in this case, she has poor tidal volume. So upstairs in hospitals, they have what's called volumetric capnography. Okay, we use time-based. So volumetric, they can actually measure volume. We can't really do that, but we can derive based on our waveform whether or not the person has good, uh, good wave, um, good exhalation or inhalation and all that jazz, right? So this is actually hypoventilation. She's not exhaling all the gases. If I were to breathe for her right now, her waveform would turn prettier and she'd have a higher gas exchange level. We gave her a little bit of Narcan because we suspected something was going on and probably what happened is the, the nurse maybe gave her too much medication or she was sneaking something, who the hell knows, but she woke right up and everything turned better and she started breathing normally, okay? So something just as simple as that, a decreased level of consciousness and we see this on the patient, that's not normal. If we put this on a patient and we see this is not, it's not what it should be, we gotta investigate to see what's going on and why, okay? So she could have been a few moments away from respiratory arrest, okay? So just because the number's low, we need to evaluate the waveform first. Is it a normal waveform? No, right? Okay, is it normal box-like shape? No, we're not even near there yet, okay? So that would lead me to believe that this reading is really, really low. Remember how I said that in the bloodstream it's always higher? Okay, so we got a VQ mismatch here. We got a ventilation perfusion mismatch. Okay, let's take another quick five-minute break. Quick one. Talking about paramedic school? Yeah. <laughs> Which paramedic school? Uh, the Fort County one. Fort County? Yeah. Who, Brian? Yeah. Mm. yeah. Before Brian. Before Brian? Uh, well, the, per the person before Brian. Peace and before Brian. Uh, well, we, well, our instructor, Are, so we went in the class thinking we were going to have Brian, but that was not the case. Oh. So we were told on multiple occasions Brian was our instructor, and we found out he wasn't. Um, we Jason? No? If it was Jason, oh. I still wouldn't be scared, but I wouldn't. Because <laughs> at least I know Jason. Yeah. Um, the individual has had a bad rap, and everyone has a bad rap. And it's, it's hard to trust someone that has a bad rap. Yeah, you got you got to keep an open mind, but a lot of times those people prove themselves right away in the, in the bad way. Yeah. That's a invigorating topic to begin with. So, and it was it was overwhelmed with war stories. <coughs> and now she's my EMT in the room. Oh, it's a she. Yeah, it's a she. <coughs> I'm really sucked out of it because Sorry. I nailed down the list, but that's yeah, not Ben. Um, Sorry. I just say how it's. Damn. Well, I'll find out later who it is. Oh, it's not. It's not Kathy, is it? All right, Kathy. I used to work with Kathy. Kathy Potts. Kathy, Kathy Potts. Yeah, yeah. I used to work with Kathy. Uh, I used to work with her at Medcor and Finley back in the day before I got hired at Perrysburg. Yeah. Wow. Did she used to teach at Owens? I don't know if she used to teach at Owens, but she. Did she used to teach at Lucas County, or does she teach? It might not. It's fine. I wouldn't say anything, but there could be somebody else. I don't know who these people are. I don't know who these people are. Because in this case, I could work with her someday. And you're going to go on 
Yeah. yeah. You gotta be careful to bad mouth people, but or receive a bad mouth. The the sad the sad thing is is that um, hopefully this isn't your impression of me tonight, but the sad thing is there's a lot of bad instructors out there, plain and simple, and you got to rely on yourself to get yourself through the material. Uh, it's it's sad to say uh, the same thing happened with me in medic school. Anybody here, Judy Ruppel? Everybody, anybody know her? She was my paramedic instructor at University of Toledo. She was the main instructor. That's when UT had a program. I slept through almost every class. One, I had sleep apnea, but two, she was just terrible. And I had to teach myself everything. Um, probably, I mean, I passed the test the first time, which is good, but was I prepared? Yeah. You know. Yeah. You like Mike? What are you laughing about? Hangman. Hangman? Oh. Has it been five minutes yet? We're missing, missing Patrick and smoking. Oh, someone vape here? Oh, sweet. I got a poll question about vaping. Hell no. Yeah, Movember. I couldn't even. It takes takes me a week to grow a mustache. Not even a week. It takes me like a month probably if I want to try it. Yeah, then I would look like my dad and my wife would get weirded out. It would totally screw things up. So. So uh, evaluating uh, ventilation, um, <clears throat> we want to evaluate ventilation just from the simple matter is how many people actually physically read a patient's respiratory rate and calculate it? Be honest. So I do, or what I used to do, right? So from the simple fact of the matter, just having this tool for a respiratory rate is accurate, number one. Number two, it's beneficial because respiratory rate becomes important with certain types of patients, okay? When I used to get runs from Toledo Fire, it was like the rule of, we call them like the rule of 16s or something like that. You got like uh, 16 respirations, you know, 60 pulse rate, 72 pulse rate, and blood pressure 120 over 80. That was like, nobody works for Toledo too, right? Sorry. I'm not saying everybody does it. But it happened, okay? So we would, get, we would get the same damn, I swear, every patient had the same vital signs. So, and the same thing happens in the ER. The same thing probably happens when we document our respiratory rate at 18. And we look at them and say, normal respiratory, you're smiling. Normal respiratory rate of 18, okay? So from a simple aspect of measuring, you'd be surprised how many people don't have a respiratory rate of 18, okay? And it turns out they have a respiratory rate of 25, and they're not labored. And we're not picking up on it. Okay. Um, we got to be careful when we're when we're looking at um, when we're measuring our ventilation. We want to be careful of secondary brain injuries. Remember, we talked about that that girl that died from the anoxic brain injury. Okay. So we want to we want to help detect something before they become hypoxic. Uh, so uh, evaluating uh, ventilation. Um, <clears throat> We want to evaluate ventilation just from the simple matter is how many people actually physically read a patient's respiratory rate and calculate it? Be honest. So I do, or what I used to do, right? So from the simple fact of the matter, just having this tool for a respiratory rate is accurate, number one. Number two, it's beneficial because 
respiratory rate becomes important with certain types of patients. Okay, when I used to get runs from Toledo Fire, it was like the rule of we call them the, like the rule of 16s or something like that. You got like uh, 16 respirations, you know, 60 pulse rate, 72 pulse rate, and blood pressure 120 over 80. That was like nobody works for Toledo too, right? Sorry, I'm not saying everybody does it, but it happened. Okay. So we would get we would get the same damn. I swear, every patient had the same vital signs. So and the same thing happens in the ER. The same thing probably happens when we document our respiratory rate at 18, and we look at them and say, normal respiratory. You're smiling. Normal respiratory rate of 18. Okay. So from a simple aspect of measuring, you'd be surprised how many people don't have a respiratory rate of 18. Okay. And it turns out they have a respiratory rate of 25, and they're not labored, and we're not picking up on it. Um, we got to be careful when we're, when we're looking at, um, when we're measuring our ventilation, we want to be careful of secondary brain injuries. Remember we talked about that, that girl that died from the anoxic brain injury, okay? So we want to we help detect something before they become hypoxic. Uh, we can, um, when we're ventilating patients, we can prevent hypotension, okay? Back in the day, I don't know how many, else, how many other people have been here as long as me or in this line of work, but we used to hyperventilate the shit out of people when we had traumas. Anybody do that? Okay. And then what do we find out? It's bad. We're killing people. So when we hyperventilate people, we're dropping their carbon dioxide artificially. And when we drop carbon dioxide levels by hyperventilation, we're creating vasoconstriction. And we create vasoconstriction, and then we reduce blood flow to the brain which we thought was a good thing, except there's oxygen in the blood and we're reducing the amount of oxygen getting to the brain. So we're actually perpetuating the problem. You guys may or may not be doing this now. Uh, if you have a patient that gets intubated and you're ventilating and you're a little excited and you're bagging them, you might not be paying attention to how fast you're bagging them. And if you're not measuring the end title or paying attention to it, you might actually be doing the same thing to your patients. So what, what should be under normal circumstances, a normal end title of 35 to 45, and you are got them down to 20, and your uh, end title of 20, and you're ventilating them at a rate of 25 or whatever it is, you could be decreasing blood flow to the brain and decreasing oxygen to the brain, okay? So that becomes important. We can do the same thing. We can create hypotension. Uh, if we don't ventilate them enough, we're actually gonna create vasodilation, which can create some hypotension and it can actually increase blood flow to the brain, which to a certain extent can be a good thing because we're gonna deliver more oxygen. But if we don't ventilate them well enough, we can actually create problems because we're gonna increase intracranial pressure, okay? Because we're sending more blood flow to the brain. Make sense? <clears throat> and about the only time anymore that we uh, hyperventilate our patients where they have herniation syndrome, and by that point, they're pretty much behind the eight ball and they're probably gonna die. So hyperventilating them at a rate of like 30 uh, in title is probably, uh, it's probably not even worth doing, but that's still kind of the standard right now, okay? The idea is they're so screwed that it's the best thing you probably do for the patient. But usually those are the severe isolated head injuries, okay? And then acidosis, um, if someone's not breathing, I, I don't cover this too much, but if someone's not breathing very well and they got a Mr. Paramedic student, if they're not breathing very well and they have a slow respiratory rate and they're, they're building up carbon dioxide, is that an acidosis or is it an alkalosis? Yeah, I'm sure that's the first one. Acidosis. Carbon dioxide is an acid. It's a volatile acid, right? So when we see a high, a high carbon dioxide level and they're not breathing very well, that would be a respiratory acidosis. On the contrary, we can we can assume, remember I said ventilation, perfusion, metabolism? We can assume if in, in the scope of our patient, if we have a patient with a low end title and they're shocky and things like that, and we have a low end title, let's say we got a cardiac arrest, okay? And we think this patient's really, really sick and we got a really low end title. Well, it could be partially ventilation. Are we ventilating an adequate rate for that cardiac arrest? Check. Yep, I'm controlling ventilations. I have a good slow rate for a cardiac arrest, and I have a good tidal volume, I'm not overventilating them in either way. Check, good. Okay, I got that one marked off. Okay, then it has to be perfusion or metabolism. Am I doing really good high quality CPR? Yes or no? 
we got to double check that right before we move on to the next thing. So let's say I'm doing crappy CPR. I'm suspecting crappy CPR. If I'm doing crappy med, do you guys uh, you guys have uh, Lucas here? Okay, so that helps take care of the problem. But maybe you got it on in a bad spot. Maybe it's not positioned appropriately. Maybe you got a shitty end title because your Lucas isn't positioned appropriately and you're not getting good blood flow with the compressions. Okay, so we would troubleshoot and figure out. Okay, am I doing something wrong? Am I ventilating too much? Am I doing it right? No, that's good. Compressions, are they good? Yep, they're good. Why is the number still low? Well, it could be a couple of things. I know I'm, I'm, I've ruled out all the things that I could possibly be doing wrong. So at that point, it could be a perfusion issue, underlying perfusion issue. It could be a really, really sick person that was dehydrated. They could have bled out, okay? It could be that trauma patient. It could be someone with an internal bleed. It could be a septic patient, okay? It could be some type of shock, in other words, and or you could have some metabolic dysfunction. Typically, when you have a shocky patient, they also have acidosis. Okay, they have some type of acidosis that would be metabolic acidosis. So um, this is one thing that drives me nuts is um, years ago when we did this shit, we just throw a drug box at somebody. We just did all kinds of stuff. And then that kind of went away. And one thing that we didn't do anymore was giving bicarb. Okay, it's not really shown to do very much in those search situations. Um, and now I'm starting to see that resurgence where people are giving bicarb willy nilly. Okay. Some of these patients we're going to look at here in a second, we're going to take that cardiac arrest patient. We got a lot of cases here and we had a lot of ROSC patients. Now we can use our waveform along with the rest of our assessment and determine which route we need to go and how we're going to treat our patient. Okay. Do they need oxygen? Do they need drugs? Do they need fluids? Okay. Cardiac arrest patient. I'm sorry, this was a head injury. So uh, roll over down the high chaparral, went tumbling, tumbling, tumbling. One of your uh, former Rossford guys, uh, not that one, but uh, another one of ours. Um, he uh, climbed in the vehicle upside down, had an unconscious patient, popped on a cannula. Beautiful, man. <laughs> Made my day. And I wasn't there either. He did it on his own. But he saw the value in it. He pops on a cannula, and what does he see in the top line there? Is that a normal waveform? No. He's got a partially obstructed airway. So what did he do? Opened up the airway. Did a jaw thrust. He had a tight spot to work with, and he opened up the airway for the time being until they can get the patient in a better situation. Okay? We had vehicle entrapment. We had two people, one of them unconscious. Okay? He adjusts the airway, and then the third line there, they confirmed the tube. Okay? So they had invasive, non-invasive cannula on to begin with. And then they transfer it over a tube and they confirm it with the tube. When you do a tube confirmation, um, number one is throw out the, uh, well, I, I can't tell you to do this, but uh, colometric devices are, are not really worth much, okay? They're, there's a lot of false positives, a lot of false negatives. You talk, I'm talking about that litmus paper type little thing that some of us still carry. Okay, this is our gold standard. Um, when you see a waveform and you get, technically you need six breaths to know for sure, okay? But when you see a waveform, and especially when you get six nice waveforms, you know you are in. You still need to confirm that you're not too far in by looking at lung sounds, listening to equal lung sounds, making sure there's not a pneumo, all the other stuff that goes along the lines with especially trauma patients, okay? But this is the gold standard, okay? Um, 12 leads, class 1A, recommendation by the AHA. I don't get too excited about the AHA, but this is also a class 1A standard, okay? For us not to do this, or for the emergency departments not to do this, which still happens, believe it or not, it's, it's unacceptable to not at least do this, okay? But hopefully you see the value of doing the other things too, like this patient here. Uh, also notice uh, we had an excited person doing ventilations and um, slightly runaway ventilations, but the ventilation rate got pretty quick from the third to the fourth one. However, they maintained an end title of 35. So not the end of the world. Okay, they actually maintained right where they're going to be. And plus, they were probably thinking isolated head injury type situation. So we're going to maintain around 30 to 35. Okay, just got to pay attention to it. When you're ventilating that patient, I, I like ventilators personally. Um, but if you're ventilating that patient with a bag, or even if you are using a ventilator, you got to make sure you own the airway. You own that airway, you make sure that you're watching that, that end title and that rate and the pulse ox and all the other stuff too. Okay. That's your job when you have that airway.
So here's one with a cardiac arrest patient we got ROSC on. We had a buttload of ROSC uh, several years ago, and um, this patient was being hyperventilated. Okay, He actually did survive, so we didn't cause hopefully too much damage. Um, but it was a good save, but you can see that we had an excited EMT that doesn't normally get the help very often. We don't have as much participation with volunteers by us, so this guy doesn't get that much contact. Okay, He wasn't on an airway. He wasn't paying attention. He didn't know any better. Okay, someone else should have been helping him along. They didn't do it either. Okay. This is an intubated patient. I think this is post ROSC, and we have on a ventilator. Uh, ventilators typically give nice regular respiratory rates, right? Is this a nice regular respiratory rate? No. All right. So the patient was probably breathing on their own a little bit. Plus, you also see those little guppy breaths in the beginning of the uh, waveform in the front there. That's probably that patient having a guppy breath, so that means they need more sedation. Oh, here's my vaping question. <laughs> As I understand it, there's several vapors here. So this could be highly controversial. <laughs> 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 I'm waiting for a no, but even the people that vape must think it's queer, so. I smell vaping. I smell it. I smell strawberries. Is that you? What is it? Oh. It's got like a, per, like a perfume. So I mentioned tube, conversion, tube confirmation. Boom. You notice in the beginning there it says CO2. That's where the CO2 is plugged in. Um, it recognized it, and then boom, our first ventilation, and it measures it instantaneously. Okay, there's a chance that if you have a tube in the in the stomach, if you're not ventilating very well, there's a possibility they have a little bit of carbon dioxide in the stomach. In that case, you'll get a little bit of a waveform, but not very much. Okay, what are you smirking about over there? Vaping? Smirking about vaping or so um, tube confirmation. There's a good case. Would you say that you've been in? So we, remember how I said we made this mandatory? Remember how we made this mandatory because we had problems with people? This is one of the problem people. Uh, there was two other guys on the scene that recognized this was a problem, and the other person said, no, I have condensation tube. I hear lung sounds. It is in. Don't trust that shit. I think that's pretty much a quote, by the way. Okay, number one is condensation a good indicator that a tube is in the right spot. So hopefully, we're being not. We 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 are using old standards to direct our future care. Okay. Um, we had just rolled out the training for this, and this happened. Some of this shit happened like the next week. I swear to God, I I, I can't make it up. Okay. So this was a very uh, nasty patient. There was puke and poop and all kinds of nasty stuff. It was a very difficult situation. They decided to intubate the patient. She was breathing on her own slightly. They did like a uh, medicated facilitated intubation. And then these guys, the other two guys are saying, this ain't right. This is not right. They had to wait till that other guy got out of the truck. And then they pulled the tube. But... Okay, so that's 15 minutes into it, they tube a person, okay? 22 minutes into it. So seven minutes or so, this patient has this. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? That's really bad. You gotta be pretty damn arrogant to tell people that you don't believe what you're seeing on this and, and continue down that same path, okay? Guy gets out of the truck, they go, fuck this, we're pulling this tube. Well, now they got the end title on the end of the bag, okay, on the end of the mask. So they got the mask, they got the end title in line that they used to have on a tube where they were recognizing nothing. And now they're bagging the patient, and this is what they see when they're bagging the patient. So this is why I firmly believe when you're bagging a patient, you should have an end title on. Whether you put a cannula on first, sometimes I'll do that with overdose patients, I'll put a cannula on, 
and then I'll bag them or, or we'll bag them, okay? Um, we're gonna get a truer reading down here rather than on the end of a mask because we'll have some dead space. It's not pretty, but we know the ventilations are getting in where they're supposed to go, okay? If we had done this to begin with and we were ventilating the patient and then we went to confirm a tube, there is absolutely 100% no doubt. There should have been no doubt already. But if we were already getting that initial value, then we go to tube, now we have something to compare to. Makes sense. All right, I said we're just going to the hospital like that and they bag the patient in. That's not you go to the hospital. You wanna look professional. You wanna look like you know what you're doing. It's your moment, you're called to the stand. You're on TV, Michael Jackson trial. Michael Jackson, remember that guy? You look at me like a blank stare, like you don't know who Michael Jackson is. You might, okay, you're pretty young, I know. But no, so Michael Jackson died from uh, uh, overdose of medications, including propofol, which is an intubation, uh, a med that they use for intubations in the hospitals, okay, and uh, sedating. And then this guy was saying what his reading was, was 16, okay. So ventilation, perfusion, metabolism. Were they ventilating right? We don't know. Were they doing compressions right? We don't know. We hope they were doing both right. If they were doing both right and you got an end title of 16, what does that say about the patient situation? It's pretty bad. Yeah. Um, as someone's dying, their metabolism, you know, it'll still kick in for a while, right? But eventually the metabolism's going to stop. Uh, the circulatory system could have been shit to begin with with perfusion, but who knows, okay? But uh, end title of 10, typically, when you do a decent amount of CPR and you do your tr treatment algorithm, you know, you got 20, 30 minutes into it. Typically, if you have an end title of 10, that means that patient's not improving. Number one is if you see a number that low, you should be trying to aggressively resuscitate them with, with something that you think is metabolism or, or uh, perfusion, okay? BVM initial, cardiac arrest. Uh, we started working on this patient. You notice in the beginning, bag valve mask. I think this was my patient, actually. Uh, do I see a good waveform when I start bagging them initially? Nope. Okay, jaw thrust. I think we did two-handed seal. And then is it a normal waveform on the second line? It's not. It's not pretty. But remember, we got a manual airway. We probably have a little bit of a tongue fall in the back of the throat or something. I'm happy. I'm getting breaths in. I'm not, I'm not going, oh, this is a bronchospasm waveform, right? I'm not doing that yet because I, don't, I can't be diagnostic. I'm just getting air in. I know I'm ventilating. We're doing compressions. And then um, over to the right there, you see those bounces? That's from the compressions. So that's mid-ventilation and there's compressions going on. Okay, makes sense? Okay. And, <clears throat> and then eventually we uh, did get a ROSC on this patient, I'm pretty sure. Had good neurologic recovery. Uh, they thought maybe he stopped breathing first, uh, had ALS or something like that. I'm not really sure that was the case, but. All right, uh, this patient, King was inserted. We see a really high end title, okay? You can use a King, you can use a King or an LMA or anything, you can use the same technology just like you would for a tube, okay? So if you pop a King or something in, same thing, confirmation. If you're not getting good breaths in, you know, if you're not getting a waveform, there's something wrong. If you got a really weird waveform that's not nice and clean, there's got to be something going on like you don't have a good cuff seal, okay? So in this case, we got a really nice waveform at the top, but it's really high. It's almost 72. Uh, in this case, this patient probably stopped breathing first, okay? So now we're talking differential diagnosis and a cardiac arrest. So now this patient probably needs more oxygenation and ventilation rather than trying to ram drugs down through an IV or an IO, okay? So H's and T's kind of steers me in the right direction so I can start working on this patient a little bit better. Also notice, though, that this waveform is normal. Okay, I can rule out bronchospasm. I can rule out some type of COPD attack. Okay, she probably stopped breathing from something. She was found face down on the floor. She might have passed out. She might have had a stroke and then suffocated, uh, breathing in a carpet. Who knows? Okay, but it gives you an idea. Uh, the the third uh, second row there, you see those bounces. Those are cardiac oscillations. That's from CPR also. That's also midstream and ventilation. When you hook up an, uh, a rescue pod, do you guys use rescue pods still? When you hook up a rescue pod, it's beautiful. It keeps a nice, clean waveform. So you don't get that bounce. It's really cool. So you can actually interpret your waveform better. Okay. Um, 
Notice the third row, we have a nice waveform, and then all of a sudden we have what? Nothing. Do you know how quickly you found that? Pretty damn quick. What was the problem? What's that? Why? What can happen with a king airway? At least in my experience. I don't know if it has been anybody else. It can migrate. It can migrate very easily. Okay. So this tube migrated and we didn't have it secured yet. And it migrated and we said, oh, hold on a second, pull back. You know, got it back in place. And then we had to do that a couple of times. And then uh, we readjust the King Airway and uh, we did get a pulse back on her, but typically those patients that stop breathing first don't do too well. So, and she had an unknown downtime. That's what he gets for faking an injury. Tea bag. Let's watch another quick video. For the Huffington Post, I'm Christina Hartman. A story of heroism and survival. Back in January, a rural Minnesota man collapsed while having a heart attack. For 96 minutes, he had no pulse. But with a special machine and determination, rescuers were able to bring him back. For more than an hour and a half, Howard Snitzer had no pulse. Emergency room doctors said there was nothing more they could do. But one of the flight nurses who had come with the emergency helicopter had been trained in capnography. Snitzer's carbon dioxide levels suggested that blood was flowing to vital organs like the heart and brain. And the nurse thought Snitzer still had a chance. It turned out to be more than a chance. Howard Snitzer has since recovered with no neurological damage. KIMT in Minnesota talked to Dr. Roger White, the doctor who oversaw the rescue. Even without a pulse, Snitzer's blood was still flowing. And we were able to maintain it in a very high range, near normal range throughout this resuscitation. Dr. Roger White gave the okay for rescuers to continue resuscitation, so nearly an hour and a half later they were able to find a pulse and get him to St. Mary's Hospital. And now the capnography machine can be used for future cases and studies on resuscitation. CNN spoke with Snitzer a few months after the rescue, and although he can't remember much from the day he collapsed, he remembers all the stories he's been told. And I, I crashed on the sidewalk, and uh, the next thing I remember was like five days later in the ICU at St. Mary's. Um, and, and the story has slowly been told to me, and it's, you know, it was, uh, it's, it's an incredible story. It, so, I'm, you know, I'm, it is I just incredible. happen to... Tell me how this is possible and why that collective group of people around him kept going when, when everything about popular culture and, and pop science tells us it didn't make sense to continue for 96 minutes. Relentless and to perfection is how the rescue effort has been described. And it wasn't just paramedics who are being pegged as heroes. Ordinary people jumped in to help too. Absolutely. 24 or so people waiting in the room giving CPR. Goodhue has a population of just 800 people. It lacks a single traffic light. But thanks to the life-saving efforts of the town's heroic citizens, Snitzer has now almost completely recovered. For the Huffington Post, I'm Christina Hartman. So what happened is that uh, flight flight nurse, he's a flight paramedic, um, called called Met Control. They, they flew to the scene. So it was a remote area in Minnesota. Flew to the scene, and um, he calls the local med control, and they said, you should terminate efforts. And he said, I'm not terminating efforts. And the reason he didn't terminate efforts is because he had reason to believe this patient was viable. One of the reasons he had believed this patient was viable is because he had a relatively normal end title reading. Okay? So he confirmed two placement. They were confirming that they had good ventilations. They were adequate. They're not too fast, not too slow. They're doing compressions. And they know that's correct. And then every reason for him to believe that that patient was viable. And he said, basically said, screw local medical control. He called that doctor, which he had been con uh, consulting with uh, back at the main base, called him up and said, I'm not giving up on this guy. And he said, all right. And uh, they end up hitting him with like 600 milligrams of amiodarone or something. Like something ridiculous. The story is pretty interesting. Um, they end up getting them back. <clears throat> and there's a lot of different ways we can start thinking about getting these patients back. End of the day is 
end title of 10 probably means they're really dead. Okay, but we got to try to work all of our animals first before we decide that they're dead. Patients like that that have an end title 20, 30, 35, we got we got to make sure we're doing everything. And then two, what's going to happen in the future eventually? Um, I see this happening in the future. We're going to start deciding what hospital to transport to for certain types of patients. So, uh, for example, there's patients that are in beef fit that we can't get them out of it. This was one of the guys. He's lucky enough to get out of it. So people are starting to do different things. They're starting to do dual sequential fib defibrillation. Some of you might have heard of that before, right? Um, that's where they're using two defibrillators and they're shocking for different angles. And so they're shocking this way and they're also shocking anterior posterior, but also they're taking people to cath labs. This is something we've been trying to push over the, over the years is taking some of these cardiac arrest patients to cath labs and doing intracardiac arrest catheterizations. Because when people are in V-fib or V-tac pulseless for more than three shocks or so, it's very unlikely you're going to get them out of it unless there's some stroke of luck or a miracle. Okay, So a lot of places are taking the cath lab. The other thing they're starting to do is they're starting to put people on heart-lung bypass. Okay, So that's something else we're trying to work on in the area is start deciding, can these patients, are they savable, and what's the best place to take them? It may not be to St. Luke's. Okay, It might not be to Mercy of Perrysburg when they actually are a freestanding hospital. Okay. It might be that we're going to an ECMO center, which right now is Toledo, St. V's, and UTMC. Okay, so we might start deciding to take those patients somewhere else based on what's their best chances of living. Okay, same thing goes with pulmonary embolisms. Okay, they're doing ECMO on those patients and they're pulling out huge clots. Unfortunately, when we get those patients, they're they're pretty far behind. When they're happening in the hospital, they're actually saving people in the hospital because they're getting to them right away. Okay. So don't ever give up unless you know absolutely. Okay, intimation confirmation. You got ROSC. You guys know that you, uh, when you get a spike in your end title that you most likely are going to have ROSC. You ever hear of that? Okay. You've got, you got carbon dioxide circulating in the blood system, and by its nature, CPR is not as efficient as a normally heart beating heart. So because there's a little bit of carbon dioxide floating in the system, Okay, when, when, you, when you're starting to get pulses back, you'll see a rise in that end tidal CO2. You should finish out your cycle, okay, whether you just started that cycle or not, continue it out for the two minutes. And then once you finish out that cycle, take off the rescue pod, check for a pulse, and continue ventilating at a normal rate, and most likely you're going to have ROSC. Okay. Now, that's different than one patient I showed you where they stopped breathing first. Notice they had a really high end tidal to begin with. Okay, that's the difference. In a true cardiac arrest where the heart stops beating, it stops beating, boom. They still have metabolism, so they might produce a little bit of metabolism with the oxygen that's in the bloodstream, but for the most part, everything's pretty much shut off. If someone stops breathing first, does their heart stop right away? No. So their heart's circulating blood volume, and it's circulating more of that residual oxygen, and the metabolism's still firing, so it's going to produce more carbon dioxide by nature. Okay, so differentiating. If I get a patient tubed in a cardiac arrest and I see a very high spike in end tidal, that's going to lead me down the path that this patient stopped breathing first. Okay, they stopped breathing first. Why do they stop breathing? Do they have a bronchospasm waveform or is it normal? Is it bronchospasm? I'm hitting them with inline nebulizers. I'm hitting them with mag sulfate. I'm doing whatever I can to open up that airway. Okay, whatever tools are at my disposal. If it's a really high end tidal and it's not a bronchospasm, now I'm starting to think that that patient suffocated. Maybe it was an OD. Maybe... Um, they stroked out and they stopped breathing. Something caused them to stop breathing that was not related to the lungs themselves as far as the bronchospasm goes. Make sense? Okay. You guys doing good? You need a break. Doing good? Okay. Let's keep on trucking. Okay. So what did I just say? Off the charts. What do you think happened? Did their heart stop first or their stop breathing first? Breathing. Stop breathing first. Okay, and then notice we got it down. We got it down, notice the waveform's normal. I'm not thinking they need nebulizers because they got a normal waveform with ventilations, okay? So we ventilate them down. The best thing, we got ROSC, okay? Tube, tube, rescue pod, oxygen. Boom. Okay, how about this one? Abnormal waveform? Classic shark fin, right? So now we have a really high end tidal uh, the first one was a tube confirmation, and you can see they're super tight because, just because of the nature of that slope, okay? 
So uh, this one only got an N9 nebulizer. The uh, paramedic was resistant to doing a mag sulfate uh, drip, but nevertheless, we did do an N9 nebulizer, and you can see that we did get some results. And remember I said patients who stop breathing first typically do the worst. Uh, she didn't survive very long, okay? She basically had an anoxic brain injury. How about this one? Okay, this one was the same thing, just as bad. Notice that really bad sloping. Notice this one's really off the charts, okay? So she was really restricted and had a lot of buildup of carbon dioxide. And then uh, we hit her with mag sulfate. We also got pulses back. She also died. Um, kind of a sad story, isn't it? Yeah. yeah, we did all these great things, but she still died. But nevertheless, there's lots of people that we help too. Okay. The reason we're recognizing this, by the way, how many patients do we, uh, this Rossford intubate a year? Or put a put a even a King Airway or something. Single digits. Single digits. So if if things, I'm going to assume. Well, we already know that most based on the answers. Okay, most people are not using this technology either here or somewhere else. Okay, so if things continue that path and we don't put a cannula on for at least more of our patients. What's the chances that we're actually going to recognize what the hell to do when we actually do have that one to two to three or four patients a year that we're intubating? Are we going to be able to use a differential diagnosis like this, like boom, right? Are we going to be able to look to see if that waveform is normal or abnormal, right? So putting it on more often is going to expose us more often. It's, it's on the job training, right? Even if we don't get it right the first time, we're using it to uh, assess our patient, and then we're maybe following up on our patient going, okay, this makes sense, it doesn't make sense, whatever else, right? Okay, as I said, this is my life story. This is, this is years ago, and this is me thinking my way through it. You guys are getting the benefit of the other side. All right, so use it with a bag, just what we mentioned. Make sure you're using it for intubation. You can use it, um, not too many people nasally intubate, but you could use it as a sensor for nasally intubating. Make sure you get in the right spot. So while you're nasally intubating, you can look for a waveform. Maintain the proper end tidal levels. Limit our pauses and compressions. Okay, if if we're using our end tidal, and we're heading down a path of doing CPR, we don't necessarily always have to stop to check for pulses. We might stop for rhythm checks, but we can limit the amount of pauses because we know pauses are bad in CPR. So if we're reading our end tidal level, and we're still doing our drugs or whatever we're doing based on what we're seeing. We can limit the amount of pauses, and we can look for a pulse through our spike in end tidal. Okay, if we see a spike in our end tidal, okay, now we're increasing, we're we're improving our compression fraction. Okay, our hands off time, or plunger off time, is reduced. Okay, so that's going to be beneficial to the patient. All right, and we can gauge the quality of the CPR. The higher the end tidal, uh, conventionally will tell us that uh, we're probably doing good CPR. And we can differential diagnosis, which we already discussed. All right. So this is a 19-year-old special needs, 19-year-old special needs female cardiac arrest at our high school. Okay. They start initial BVM. I'm liking it. They got a bag valve mask on, and they're also uh, they got the end title on. Beautiful. They know they they know they're getting ventilations because they see a waveform. Uh, they had some anatomical considerations, and they had trouble tubing this patient. They put a king airway in. And that top one, do you see a waveform with the King Airway in? See a waveform, right? We're good. Post King Airway going in, you still see a waveform going down there, right? Okay. And right there, it's a little bit less and a little bit less. Now, if you look on the side chart, you got zero, and then you got the numbers going up to 35. Okay. So I think each one of those numbers is like eight or something like that. I guess I could do the math, but I'm not going to. Um, Depending on your monitor, actually most monitors, you're not going to see what happened. Remember I talked about the print button earlier? So these guys put the king in, and then they got confused because they didn't push the print button. This is what you would see if you pushed the print button. But because things are condensed on the screen, what they saw was a flat line. Okay. And what does a flat line mean when you try to confirm a tube placement? It's not in. So now they sent themselves down the wrong path. Imagine the chaos and the confusion already there with a 19-year-old special needs female in the library of a high school with people freaking out. And 
Does your adrenaline get a little pumped up when you have somebody that's younger versus some old geezer that you're working? Okay, so they got confused. I'm, I'm not blaming them. It's just the situation that happened. Ironically, they brought uh, about a month later, or maybe even less than that, we brought somebody in to teach just like we're teaching now, okay? Somebody from uh, Medtronic. Back then it was Iridian. And he came in and he told this amazing story of something. He was from Delaware. Uh, similar situation. And these guys, their jaws dropped. Their jaws dropped. And they said afterwards, they're like, it makes sense. We, we just didn't know what happened. And this is right when we made this transition. Remember I said we made this transition to making it mandatory? We had people that were resistant. We had people that didn't want to learn. We had people that didn't think they needed to know this stuff. And then all of a sudden they had that moment of like, son of a bitch. I just made things more difficult for myself. Okay. So if they would have pushed a print button, they would have seen that the tube was in. Then they could have went down the path and say, okay, why is the end title so freaking low? Are we ventilating right? Are we compressing right? What else is going on? So if we got a cardiac arrest patient, what else are we checking for? What are, what are you guys normally doing now? Bueller? What are you doing? Okay, H's and T's. So what are some of the things you're checking for? Blood sugar, pulse ox. Okay, you're going to do your drug algorithm, right? Okay, so this, this girl's blood sugar was five something. Okay, what does that tell you? She wasn't a diabetic, though. She probably, she could be ketoacidotic or she could be that non-ketonic kind, right? So uh, she, she's, non, she's non-verbal. For some reason, she's special needs, but she's in the high school. She's non-verbal. She had been sick for a little while. Uh, at home, she can't communicate to her family that she's not doing so hot, okay? Her parents send her off to school. She's got a decreased uh, uh, level of consciousness, probably a little lethargic. Sitting over in the library, kind of fades off into the oblivion and ends up going into cardiac arrest, okay? Now, when someone has, uh, let's say she was ketoacidotic, she probably would have had Kussmaul's respirations, right? Someone would have been like, holy shit, something's wrong, right? But that didn't pop up. So she was probably non-ketonic, hyperosmolic, ketoacidosis type thing, right? But her, when someone has high blood sugar, what are they trying to do to correct it? Uh, aside from Kuzmals, what's their normal thing that they're trying to do? Well, yes, yes. So that, but also they want to get the, the sugar out of their bloodstream, okay? In this case, if, if they have an insulin problem, their insulin's not going to be able to correct it, right? So their next choice is? Pee a lot. Sorry, they're peeing off. So my guess is she was peeing a shitload and nobody noticed, okay? So now she's profoundly dehydrated, she's acidotic, and she's got a decreased level of consciousness and she's slightly faded off, okay? So now we take blood sugar, we go, why do we have a low end tidal? Are we doing good ventilations? Are we doing good compressions? Wait a minute, we got a really low end tidal. And now maybe you're getting this patient before they go into cardiac arrest. Now what are you gonna do? Either way, you're gonna do the same thing. Okay. Epi is probably going to help in this case because you've got to get a squeeze down, right? So maybe you're going to do an epi drip or something, but lots and lots of fluids, right? That's the best chance for this patient to get lots and lots of fluids, okay? So it's going to change how we, we, how we look at our patients, okay? It's going to narrow things down. Who won the Super Bowl? I was going to say who won the World Series, but... It's over so quick. <laughs> There's always next year. Yeah, the Lions are like just as bad as the Browns. Steelers, Patriots, same old, same old song and dance, right? I don't know who's gonna win. What's the Super Bowl? Must be a Browns fan. <laughs> All right. Let's take a quick five minute break again, guys.
you look familiar. I knew you looked familiar. Okay. What's that? Which one? Uh, yeah, it's probably about right. Oh, really? Were you there for that? I bet it was nuts. Yeah, and that was exactly what they relayed. And uh, I shit you not, there was um, there was probably five, six people on that call. The better half, better than half of them were people that I was having problems with uh, trying to incorporate this. Right. And, and think about how much of a wrench that throws in, that just one simple thing, one simple act, you're in the heat of the moment and you don't push the print button. They were They were almost there. You know what I mean? So the only thing we can do is learn from that experience. And, and um, But most of the monitors are not going to show anything below like eight or nine. So. I think it's both. Okay. A lot of us that have been around for a while, we, we tend to rest on our own laurels. We tend to rest on what we already know. We get comfortable, we get complacent. Um, and that can go with any subject matter, right? Um, it's, it's disheartening to see that many instructors that really don't know much about this at all. Uh, the other problem is we don't have enough people teaching it, you know, period. So the instructors don't know what the hell they're doing. And so what do the instructors usually do when they don't know what they're doing? Well, good ones will look it up and try to learn more, right? But a lot of them, they just click through it and say, ah, you're, we don't really use this much. We're not going to do it. Don't worry about it. Okay. And yeah. Yeah. It's so nice. And now, I'm from the perspective, too, I was a naysayer. I'm free and willing to admit it. But at least I did my due diligence to come up with a reason why I shouldn't be doing it. If I just say, if I just say no, we're not doing it, to me, I'm not doing my job. You know? So uh, we're, we're doing that right now with Airway. Um, a lot of the guys want to do uh, RSI, like true paralytic and everything else. I've never really had too many problems tubing people with the medications we have. But what, what is it that, why, why? Why do these guys feel we need RSI? That, that needs to be investigated, right? And then the more I investigate it, the more I investigate it, the more I realize I don't know as much as I thought I knew to begin with. And oh, by the way, the stuff that we're doing right now is wrong. So our protocol hasn't kept up with the uh, research, the literature, and the improvements just in that one protocol. And so it can easily happen. You can be caught snoozing, and next thing you know, you know you're behind. So um, unfortunately, I know a lot of instructors, and we have several instructors that work for us. There's, there's a few of them that were really hard to convince. Some of them are convinced. Some of them are a waste of time. Um, and it's a shame. And usually that's rooted in arrogance, too. Um, the, the people that, that refuse to learn this stuff are to realize that, um, that they can benefit from it themselves. You know? So, all right. Let's keep on trucking, guys. All right, metabolism. We talked about metabolism a pretty decent amount already. Okay, there's aerobic and anaerobic metabolism. Aerobic, of course, is when you're consuming oxygen, and we're doing that right now. We're in aerobic metabolism. If I get my leotards on and I do aerobics, I'm in aerobic metabolism. But if I go out and run a marathon like my wife just did the other day, she probably went into anaerobic metabolism because she's consuming, her body is consuming more than what her oxygen can supply, right? Or her body can supply an oxygen, right? So <clears throat> that's when anaerobic metabolism goes in. Uh, when you have anaerobic metabolism that is strongly 
usually you'll have elevated lactate levels. So we measure lactate in Perrysburg uh, for certain types of patients. Um, not many people do that, but the point I want to make is when you have anaerobic metabolism, you will have a decrease in entitled CO2 because it's also tethered to metabolic acidosis. Okay, so anaerobic metabolism itself can produce a low entitled CO2 because if you think about it, how do we how do we produce carbon dioxide? What is the process? We breathe in oxygen. Oxygen circulates through the bloodstream. It goes to the cells. The cells use the oxygen and the sugars and all that other jazz, which maybe you could probably explain better than me because you're going through school right now for it. Or else maybe your instructor went, yeah, right, like we were just talking about. We're going to, ah. She's, she's an instructor? I've heard so many bad things about her. Yeah. So don't worry. I don't think there's anybody in the world that actually thinks – I've never heard, I have never heard anything nice. Like, so like some, some people, like there's probably some people that like me. There's probably some people, I know there's people that don't like me. Okay. But there's a little bit of both. If you have like everybody loves you or everybody hates you, you're probably doing something wrong. Like if you have some people that like you and then some people that can't stand you, you're probably doing something right because you're pissing people off and you're making people uncomfortable. Right. So that's my theory. So if you get 100% people that can't stand you, then there's probably a problem. But, um, but whoops. Okay, hemoglobin, the same thing. We have a low hemoglobin. We can have a low end tidal CO2. It's just a little nifty trick. The reason I say that is because look at this EKG. Uh, I know there's a lot of basics in the room, but uh, everybody usually has a pretty decent baseline. What do you guys see um, on this EKG? What's that? Squiggles, <laughs> good. You must be a basic. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so the paramedics in the room, the paramedics. Okay, depression. Pretty much everywhere. Yeah. So this this lady went to the local uh, cardiologist. She was getting ready to have a stress test. She was like eighty something year old female, and she didn't even have a stress test yet. She was sitting in the lobby. And she was having like just this terrible aching pain, chest pain, like uncomfortable, couldn't get comfortable, whatever else. And uh, so we're getting called for chest pain. Cardiologist, uh, who I actually know, he's a really cool guy, um, awesome guy, awesome cardiologist, comes in and helps us teach actually, uh, do 12 leads. And uh, we whip off our 12 lead also, confirm the same thing, broad ST depression. What could be causing broad ST depression? Sometimes we say pericarditis, right? Is that one of them? Usually global ST depression is pericarditis. Um, we uh, take vital signs, and her vital signs are relatively normal. And normally for chest pain, what do we do? Oxygen, nitro, sometimes morphine still, aspirin. Okay, so we go to give her nitro, and um, I think maybe we got a spray in her so, and I said, hold on a second, this isn't right. How many of you would be ballsy enough to not give nitro to a chest pain patient that has ST depression? Someone's gonna kick, someone's gonna yell at you most likely. Okay, let's just, let's just admit it. Someone's gonna yell at you. So we only gave like one nitro or something and she was just coming off the cot. Like something was just strange about this. So we have an end title, we had an end title of like 20, 25. What's our normal level supposed to be? Okay, what the hell's going on? She's not breathing fast. She, was, she had like a respiratory rate of 12. She's, she could be faking. Oh, it could be sepsis, but it's not. Could be, uh, I love sepsis. But um, it wasn't sepsis. She had just writhing chest pain. She had a good pulse ox. She had a good blood pressure. Everything was fine. Low end title, it had to be something else. Well, it turned out she had anemia. She had anemia. She had chest pain and she had depression because she wasn't getting enough oxygen to her heart. <laughs> her heart was pissed off, right? So is nitro going to help that situation? I don't think so. So whenever I see a patient that has chest pain and has a low end title, I always think twice about whether or not this is a true ACS chest pain. At least think about it, okay? At least use your spidey senses and go, something doesn't seem right here. 
okay? So it was pretty cool. It she ended up being anemic, and I've seen this before. Um, and obviously, we don't know for sure. We can't say that's anemia, right? But we can, we can use a little bit of our assessment and go, okay, this, this isn't our typical chest pain. Maybe it's pneumonia. They have chest pain from pneumonia, and then titles off, okay? In that case, they have low pulse ox, too, most likely, with the pneumonia patient. All right, there was the vital signs to prove I wasn't bullshitting you. So anywhere from, uh, she had a little bit of variation in her respiratory rate, but you can see her respiratory rate was okay. It was like 20, 22, 24 at the most, um, which is not bad, and it's not going to cause that low of an end title. All right, so. Perfusion, this is the uh, little golden nugget of capnography. So here's a patient. Now we're getting into good stuff, guys. I just spent all this time going through all these fine details. Now we're going to test you. We're going to test your knowledge, skills, and abilities. Nausea and vomiting, time to call 09600, ill male. When you arrive, you find a, a awakened oriented 30-year-old male, sudden onset, profuse nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. He's laying on the couch in a fetal position, no apparent distress. He said the onset was at 0600 hours while he was sleeping. He had cramping in his legs, hands, and stomach. What's your first initial impression of this patient that I described to you? Could be. He doesn't appear in any distress. If most of us, what's that? Yeah, don't be a big pussy, right? Does anybody mind if I say that? Okay. So... Most of us, if we're, if we're really, and I've, I've, I've taught this in a lot of different places, okay, a couple conferences and things like that, and there's always somebody, like more than one person, they all go, pussy. Like, it's, like, it's synonymous across our line of work, right? Get on the cot, you, you lazy little wimp. Get on the cot, we're going to take you to the hospital. Okay. History of events. He arrived at home from work, uh, 2,300 hours, uh, must work like second shift or something, ate dinner at midnight. No abnormalities noted at that time. He said he felt fine. And that's, uh, then at 0600, he awoke with that profuse nausea, vomiting, diarrhea. And he's still in that fetal position, like I mentioned. Uh, no real, he's a 30-year-old guy. No real medical history. Meniscus surgery, uh, uh, tear, uh, times one month ago, actually, which is kind of odd. A uh, history of a similar event that he had one to two years ago. And uh, they diagnosed him that time with renal failure. So there's your vital signs. You guys see anything odd with the vital signs there? Pulses are a little high. Not, not anything worse than I would expect, though. I mean, he's been sick, right? What's that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I think this happened in the wintertime, and we used to do the tympa or not tympanics. Yeah, tympanics. Uh, this kind of sucks sometimes, but um, people still bitch about our temporal ones. But nevertheless, it could have been right, could have been wrong. We'll just guess that it was wrong. Or right, so maybe a little ten. So uh, we already figured per provider impression a little bit. We talked about, it, but go ahead and type in what you think. Food poisoning, stomach bug, he's sick, good, dehydration flu, food poisoning, flu, ate something bad, also known as food poisoning, or maybe he just ate something bad, yeah, not dying, sick, Dehydrated from stomach bug. So essentially what we're doing is differential diagnosis, right? We're kind of trying to funnel down and figure out what's going on. We all know that he's been vomiting. Ooh, potassium salt issue. Sick. Okay. DFO. Done fell out. Yeah. Sepsis. <laughs> uh, everything's sepsis till proven otherwise, okay? Okay. So here's the end title they got put on. This is, after, again, right after it became mandatory. What do you see? 
Very low. Why is it low then? I mean, his respiratory rate's good. Is it ventilation? Huh? Could be. Uh, could it be perfusion? Could be, right? Could it be metabolism? Could be partly. Remember, ventilation, perfusion, metabolism. We always have to take it in consideration. We ruled out ventilation. It has to be something with perfusion and or metabolism. It could be one, two, three, or all things, okay? Five hundred mLs. If you gave a fluid bolus, how much fluid would you give this guy? He had a blood pressure of one sixteen, pulse rate or blood pressure. Yeah, I think it was one sixteen systolic, and he had a pulse rate of one sixteen. Be honest, how much fluid would you give this guy? Not a lot. This, he got a two fifty bolus. Okay, so he got roughly what's in this bottle. Think about that for a second. A lot of us are like a little anxious about giving fluid to patients. This, a third of this is going to stay in the bloodstream. Okay, two thirds of that's going to absorb into the system. So, is a 500 bolus going to do much for someone that's really, really sick? No. Um, so, in this case, this guy, he didn't get completely blown off. They gave him 250 of fluid, right? But he had a normal pulse rate, relatively normal pulse rate. He was relatively young. He had a relatively normal blood pressure. So we're just going to do a little bit of a small fluid bolus, take him to the hospital. What do you think happened to the hospital? Yeah. I mean, obviously, that's part of the story, right? He sat in the hospital. Okay, we're going to take your blood. We're going to do this. We're going to, you know, the typical sit in the hospital for three, four hours, whatever it is. And then meanwhile, what happened? He went into renal failure. Okay. Remember that little key history there? He went into renal failure uh, once before. So he went into acute renal failure. Okay. Hopefully he turned a curve. But again, that's something we could have did to help keep that guy from getting into that situation or at least that badly into a situation. Okay. Also notice the other thing, he just had surgery. He had a meniscus tear. He could have threw a PE. He didn't have a high respiratory rate. Did you guys think that? Yeah, you didn't put it on the board. You didn't type it in. Oh. <laughs> so yeah, he, he could have had a PE also. So now, if, if, if someone had a PE, they would, and I've seen this before, usually they're impending arrest also. They're like, um, just passed out, something strange like that. This guy had nausea and vomiting, so probably doesn't quite fit the mold. But what if it was a little bit a different situation? We had a guy, love his comments, passed out, sinkable, uh, 65 years old, something like that. Couldn't figure out why he passed out. Nobody knew. Hadn't been complaining of anything. Uh, they're, they're trying to go through all this bullshit with backboarding him and everything else. He didn't need to be freaking backboarded. He said he couldn't breathe. He was having trouble breathing. And they hook him up to the pulse ox. Everything's fine. They get him on. They, they did put him on a cannula, but most likely they didn't pay attention to it because some of the people that, you know, just hook it up to hook it up. And he had an end title of, like, 10. Like, that's bad. That's like really bad. So if that was like cardiac arrest bad, that means like we're not getting anywhere bad, right? So that guy had a PE most likely. He did, did end up arresting on the way to the hospital. Okay. And he ended up dying. Uh, they were also trying to lay him flat. That's probably not a good position for anybody complaining of difficulty breathing, but they were so fixated on putting him on a freaking backboard and seat collaring him that they, they lost track of, and, I'm, and again, I'm not pitting blame. We can always just learn stuff. Okay, but we lost track of what the problem was. We were so focused on collaring somebody, we weren't really paying attention to uh, the sinkable episode. So if I have a fire truck, you see my handy dandy fire truck, and I take my, two and a, or my inch and three quarter line, my uh, 200 foot line, and instead of flowing the nozzle, I recirculate it back into the pump. Okay, that's my, that's my nozzle. Uh, inch and three quarter line, what do we normally flow that out GPM wise? Anybody? Anybody here a firefighter that pumps a fire truck with water? I got a combination nozzle. What do I want to usually flow at? 100, 150, 100, 100, okay, I'm going to say 150 because my nozzle doesn't do 135, but GPMs, right? So nevertheless, what's our PS guy, PSI typically going to be for that fire truck? If I'm pumping a 200-foot two, cross leg, what am I going to be pumping at, engineers? Any engineers in here? 
All right, let's just say we're pumping 135, 140 PSI, something like that. All right, so we're pumping. I'm really scared, Rossford. <laughs> so uh, I'm pumping 140, 150 PSI, whatever else. Let's say I got a leak. So I got a leak somewhere. I'm not hooked up to a hydrant. I'm just using tank water. I got a leak somewhere, and my tank is getting low. And I start hearing this gurgling sound in the pump. What does that mean? I could be aspirating, or I could be cavitating, right? So I'm cavitating. I'm cavitating because I don't have enough circulating volume to make it through that inch and three quarter hose line back to the fire truck. Follow me so far? Okay. So if I want to sustain any type of circulation through that hose line, what can I do? What can I do to problem solve with that pump? Okay, up the pressure. So I'm already low on volume. If I up the pressure, that doesn't count. So if I increase the pressure, but I don't have enough circulating volume, I might just make the cavitation worse. I probably will. So what's my next choice? I could back off in the pressure, but I still don't have enough circulating volume. What if I, what if I kick it, hit it? What if I, what if I get a smaller hose line? We don't have booster lines anymore, but what if I went to an inch and a half hose line instead of an inch and three quarter, right? If I squeeze down the hose line, do I have to circulate as much volume? No. Okay. But when I squeeze down the hose line, in order to maintain the same flow, what do I have to do to the pressure? Up it, Up it right? So that's when it increases. I got to clamp down first, and then I got to increase it. All right. So hopefully we're following this so far. So we got gallons per minute. That's how much we're flowing. We got the hose diameter. We know we got to squeeze that hose diameter down. But because we squeeze the hose diameter down, because we're low on fluid, we have to increase the pressure. Follow me so far? OK. So now if I take the same type of philosophy and I say, this is my body. The fire truck is my body. And the pump is my heart. My GPMs is my perfusion. That's my circulating blood volume. Okay? The hose is my vasculature. You follow me so far? If I'm low on fluids, what's the best way for me to maintain that circulation aside from hooking up to the hydrant and or adding fluids? If I, if I, if I don't have the ability to give IV fluids right now, what's, what's my body's response going to be? Wait a minute. What do we look for in shock? What do we look for in blood pressure? Don't, don't think too much. What do we typically, what are we taught to look for, for shock? Low blood pressure. But we just said that the pressure is going to increase because our vascular needs to squeeze down. Okay. This is why we need to stop looking solely at blood pressure as an indicator of shock. Okay. That last guy, he had a normal blood pressure, a slightly high pulse rate, but he had a shit end title of 14. Okay. Our end title was measuring the gallons per minute. Okay. Indirectly, our blood pressure, we think we're measuring the hose diameter. We're not. Okay. The hose diameter is our systemic vascular resistance. The blood pressure is an indirect relationship to what's going on with the perfusion and the hose diameter. Okay? That's why an end title will be more predictable with regards to where that patient's going to go. Okay? Make sense? Hopefully. So systematic implementation. Initial impression, are they sick or not sick? Be careful with that because you just saw that last guy that was a pussy ended up going to renal failure. Evaluate the waveform. Evaluate the numbers. Is it low, high, or normal? Is there a VQ mismatch likely? And how are we going to deal with that? And evaluate those trends and changes. Here's a diff breather. I'll let you read it. Can you picture it? 
Okay. Is that you guys? Hey, it's a good thing it's recorded. Overdose? Is that you guys? Don't take it out on the patient. <laughs> All right. So short and stout, needs a mask, sudden onset difficulty breathing, history of CHF one year, and she's a diabetic. Got it so far? So here's your assessment. That's initial assessment. Um, what are you guys thinking so far? Well, don't say it yet. I think I got a little blue screen there. Okay, you're thinking CPAP. That's what you have so far. That's all I had. This is my patient. This is what we have. Notice how moi hooked up the end title right away. Which you'd expect, right? Yeah, thank you. Thank you. And this is what we see with the waveform. Is it normal waveform or not? No. Is the respiratory rate fast? The level? The level is a little bit low, but not super low, right? What's missing on this? What's missing on the waveform? Yeah, I'm missing a little bit of plateau. There, there is a little bit of plateau, but see how it's kind of peaked? Baseline's pretty good, though. All right. So what's your impression so far? This is all you have to go by. You've got to make quick decisions. This person's going to die in front of you if you don't do something. Some of you are giving up on the phone. Oh, you just weren't paying attention. Respiratory distress, very good, good. Someone being a smart ass maybe, I don't know. She needs some help. CHF, CHF. Respiratory distress, glad we narrowed it down there. All right. All right, cool. So we put her on CPAP, and this is what we get. Do you see an improvement in the waveform? Mm -hmm. uh, notice we're getting some more vital signs rolling in now. Uh, a little bit of a high pulse rate. What's her pulse ox saying? Pretty low. Did you see what the initial pulse ox was? Yeah, it was like in the 70s, OK? That's, that's some bad shit right there, OK? So we get her on CPAP. Uh, she seems to be improving. She's still got a high respiratory rate, but notice she's got a really high respiratory rate, but her end title is relatively normal. Notice how it went up a little bit too. Remember, she didn't have a good plateau, okay? So she had that disparaging um, ventilation perfusion mismatch, and we narrowed that gap a little bit by putting her in CPAP. So we helped her in a little bit, but she's also got a little bit of a rising baseline now too, okay? So she's recirculating some carbon dioxide. Um, blood pressure sky high. We, we, we are treating her as CHF, okay? We're hitting her hard. We're getting her with nitro. We have her staying up and pivots at the cot because she's kind of a big lady. Oh, and by the way, she started having chest pain a week or so ago. So, indigestion, I'm sorry. Indigestion. She's diabetic, though. Indigestion a couple weeks ago. A week or two ago, the husband said, as he's sitting there nonchalantly in the chair, not getting too excited. And as we're moving to the uh, ambulance, this is what we start seeing on the waveform. And along with her pulse ox and end title and all that stuff. Notice how her pulse ox is dropping. Notice how her waveform is getting really choppy. What do you think is going on with this choppy waveform? When we start filling up with fluids in our lungs, is it easier to breathe or diff more difficult to breathe? 
So she's struggling to get that air exchange, right? Here you're starting to see she's not singing show tunes. She's not getting better, right? So she's starting to have some waning in her respiratory effort, which is causing a really sick-looking waveform, okay? As you can see, it's getting worse and worse. Now we're realizing we're going to have to intubate her. Oh, and by the way, uh, she looks like she's having an MI, okay? So she's got an LAD going on. And in this point right here, in the back of the medic, she's starting to stop breathing. That's what we see. We're trying to ventilate her. Is it easy to ventilate a person with CHF? Mm -mm. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of resistance. Also, maybe we weren't doing a very good job because I think we had one person trying to ventilate instead of one person getting a good mass seal. Maybe we need to do a rescue airway. Maybe we need to pop in a king or an LMA very briefly to try to bring her oxygenation up and then intubate her later. Uh, I was just talking earlier about how we were going through our RSI protocol, and I realized now that some of the things we were doing, including this, was not necessarily the best thing for the patient. She was severely hypoxic. Uh, we did end up uh, intubating her. I think maybe we used Atomidate uh, very briefly, but we were at risk of causing a cardiac arrest because she was so low in her oxygen saturation. Okay, She was a difficult intubation. Uh, originally, I went to use a King Vision, and I couldn't get the King Vision channel blade in her mouth. That's how tight her mouth was. And luckily, we got uh, direct visualization. Well, not direct, but we used a regular Mac blade and used a, a bougie, and luckily got it in as we're all holding our breath. Um, she did survive. When we tubed her and got the tube in place, we confirmed it. And then do you see a really, really high end title there? All right. Uh, over at 9.37 the time, you can see it was up to 90. Okay. So that, that carbon dioxide was building up as she went into respiratory arrest. She essentially went into respiratory arrest, and then we knocked it out the rest of the way with the Atomidate. Right? Um, so then we, we were working with PEEP. You guys use PEEP? You guys have PEEP valves? Okay, PEEP, PEEP is CPAP for, for tubes. Okay, so in theory, you should try to carry PEEP as well. PEEP basically is creating CPAP pressure. So <clears throat> we use PEEP on her, and then uh, one of the guys... Had an ingenious idea is he started spraying nitro underneath this lady's tongue after we tubed her and started hitting her with nitro. And um, I think that really helped her a lot. And that was a great idea because why not, right? So we had to reduce her blood pressure. We had to get forward blood flow. We were doing that with positive pressure ventilation, but also PEEP. The PEEP is maintaining pressure just like CPAP, so it's helping get that forward blood flow. Adding all that nitro is vasodilating. And then um, she actually do it, ended up doing pretty well. They didn't take her to the cath lab because they thought it was an old MI because of the indigestion for a week or so. <clears throat> um, but she ended up doing pretty well from what I remember. Here's another one. Diff breather, 74-year-old male, onset difficulty breathing, audible crackles in the bases. Here's your pulse rate or your vitals. Okay. You guys got that so far? Sorry if I moved too quick. Did I move too quick? Here's the history. History of CHF, COPD, heart, hypertension, etc. So that's not really helping us much, right? Could be like one of anything. What are your treatment thoughts so far? Treatment thoughts slash impression. Pulse rate looked like it was 146. Blood pressure was sky high. Pulse ox was low. Monitor flagged at SVT. History of COPD, CHF, hypertension. COPD flare-up. <laughs> is that like Jeopardy? What is capnography? Or what is capnography? Nitro CPAP. Slow the heart rate, assess rhythm. Okay, so we got a variation of uh, different ideas. And we've seen this patient more than one time. 
and every one of those ideas were applied at a different time. So you guys aren't necessarily off base. So this guy was treated differently just about every time, all the time incorrectly. Um, so yes, lung sounds. Lung sounds you couldn't quite tell. Uh, no, audible crackles in the bases, sorry. This one was audible crackles in the bases. Bilateral. Mm. All right. So this was the same patient another time. Remember I said we had it multiple times. So I didn't have a waveform saved from the last guy or the first time. But notice on this one, he has a relatively normal waveform. He has a high respiratory rate. And then as time goes on, his waveform is getting worse and worse and worse. In this case, he was treated as a CHF. He was given CPAP and nitro and everything else. Notice that that waveform got worse and worse and it started getting really low. He was going into respiratory failure and he ended up buying a tube. Okay. Bilateral crackles on the basis. He has a history of COPD. One thing I purposely left out is he had bloody sputum. What does bloody sputum possibly mean? He's spitting up a little bit of blood. Not a lot, just coughing and spitting up some blood once in a while. What does that usually mean? This, this you, if you don't do this very, or, this you could easily miss, and it was missed. So this is looking back on things. So bloody sputum with a COPD ear, you might want to start thinking about pneumonia. Okay, COPD people, one, oftentimes get pneumonia just based on their uh, mucus secretions and shit getting caught in there. Okay, so whenever you have a COPD ear, don't automatically assume it's COPD. Think about pneumonia. Two, uh, we uh, didn't check for a fever. He had a fever. Okay, dead ringer right there. Low pulse ox, uh, fever, bloody sputum. He had bilateral crackles, which led us astray thinking it was CHF. And also he had a really high blood pressure. But remember the fire truck? The fire truck, he's stressed out. Other things can cause high blood pressure. It's not always going to be a pump, right? Just the stress of the situation, this, his struggle to stay alive can cause him to clamp down. He could have been partly uh, bad perfusion, bad oxygenation, gas exchange, clamp down, okay? Uh, he probably was septic that time too. Uh, we've seen him since then. He had open heart recently. He was in a nursing home, and I had a chat with him. And, uh, yep, he was septic one time. He had pneumonia. Uh, do you remember me talking to him? Yeah. So uh, it was a very, very unique conversation. So it's always neat to see these different people, and then you can follow up and, and double check. But uh, in this case, respiratory failure. What kind of CPAP machines do you guys use here, or devices? Flow safes? Flow safes are really nice. One thing that I learned is you got that gauge on there, manometer gauge. You use that to tell that you're getting good pressure, right? If you notice, the pressure gauge goes up when they breathe out. If, if this patient's doing this down here, you're going to start noticing that pressure gauge is not as responsive anymore. So that's a good little trick to look for is that gauge is not as responsive and you're seeing this. They're most likely starting to go downhill and fail in respiratory. Okay. And then also, if they're sucking down really fast, if they're saying they're not getting relief, Another thing you can do is you look at that gauge. If it's getting bottomed out when they're breathing in, that means the flow of the oxygen is not keeping up with their demand. So turn on your cannula underneath and provide a little supplemental oxygen. And that will also help increase their pulse ox. But also it's going to provide them extra flow. And it's going to maintain that peep more often. Okay. All right. This one. We're going to move kind of quick here because we're out of time. This patient, this patient, this is another differential diagnosis. So the last one had a low end title, pneumonia, low end title, okay? You might have a clean waveform, you might not. It depends on how bad the gas exchange is, okay? This guy had really, really bad at gas exchange. That is actually a real reading. That's like putting it on going, wait a minute, this can't be right. Double checking to make sure you're getting a good reading. So this is a, this is a true reading. We put them on oxygen and CPAP, and you see an improvement in waveform. Why would there be an improvement in waveform like that with somebody with difficulty breathing, low pulse ox, um, really low pulse ox, like 60 or 70? Put them on PEEP, and when you put them on PEEP, you're expanding parts of the lung, uh, a VLI that maybe are not already expanded, or maybe oxygen is not reaching it to begin with. Okay, so when you put them on PEEP, you're creating that a VLI expansion, so you're getting oxygen to more areas of the lung providing for better gas exchange. 
So we have an improvement because we're also transferring carbon dioxide a little bit better. All right. And then, but it still was shitty. Paul Sox never came up to like above 88% maybe. All right. So what he had going on, this is something, you can say this to your paramedic instructor, Wendy. You're like, oh, he, he had a shunt. So he had a shunt. There's, there's like four different causes of hypoxemia. Okay, hypoxemia is in the blood. Emia. Uh, one of them is shunt. So that's like the worst type of hypoxia or hypoxemia you can have because it's a roadblock in the alveoli. So you got the alveoli, you got the bloodstream, and right here where the gas exchange is, you got a roadblock. That's what a shunt is. So whenever you have a patient that's not responding to your oxygen therapy, most likely they have a shunt going on, and most likely they're going to have to buy a tube eventually, okay? Because they're not going to keep on going down that route, especially if you're giving PEEP or if you're giving CPAP and you're giving supplemental oxygen underneath. If they're not improving still, most likely they're going to need a ventilator and they're going to need lots of PEEP in order to uh, overcome that, okay? A lot of times, too, you'll see this. Patients with persistently low pulse ox, this is a whole other paradigm here. Persistently low pulse ox is not improving with oxygenation. Persistently low end tidal CO2, and maybe you listen to lung sounds and you think it's a CHF patient. Well, based on what I told you, it's not going to be. Remember, high respiratory rate, normal end tidal. If you get a high respiratory rate, low pulse ox, and a low end tidal, okay, start thinking outside of the box. Think about acute respiratory distress syndrome. Think about really bad shunt, pneumonia. They're all kind of tied together. You guys ever hear of acute respiratory distress syndrome? ARDS? Okay, look it up sometime. Uh, a lot of patients that end up having sepsis or pneumonia, they're, they're kind of like close cousins. And acute respiratory distress syndrome, you will have this profoundly hypoxic person. This is probably one of them. Profoundly hypoxic and just is starving for oxygen. They're in the 60s or 70s, and they're, they're not, we, sometimes they look like they're faking it because they're, so, they're freaking out so bad. But don't dismiss that and get them oxygen, and most likely what it is is ARDS, okay? A lot of times we'll treat ARDS as CHF because we see a high blood pressure and they're, they're presenting like a CHFer. They're freaking out, okay? So normal end tidal, high respiratory rate, think about CHF. Low end tidal, high respiratory rate, think something else. Think perfusion, think poor gas exchange, okay? Make sense? Hopefully. If not, follow up on the recording. All right, general endos called uh, difficulty breathing, back pain, 1408 hours. Kidney, a kidney transplant, this is a really good case. <clears throat> She's uh, semi-complete respirations, or uh, sentences, I'm sorry, labored respirations, alert and oriented. She's 42-year-old female. Mid-lower right back pain, flank pain, she's complaining of. Uh, uh, 10 of a 10, no provocation. Uh, somewhat positional, kind of like... Yeah, you know, but she put a heating pack on it. She thought it helped, but then it returned later. She had the pain again. Sorry. She's legally blind. She had a kidney transplant in 06, and this call was in 12, 2012. So six years ago, six years prior, she had a kidney transplant. Uh, the right kidney is in place and non-functional. The left kidney is a transplant. She has a productive cough noted during the course of treatment, but she says it's a normal phenomenon. Due to sinus congestion, she also has a fistula in the right list, wrist, and she is non-dialysis. So she just had a checkup at her transplant center a week ago up in Michigan. She complains of dyspnea and exertion and fatigue to the physician on site. So the physician doubled her Bumix prescription. What's Bumix? Yeah, basically it's a water pill, right? Makes them pee more. He noticed that she had some swelling in her ankles, and he also noticed that her creatinine level was normal uh, during checkup. Uh, which is a measure of kidney function, okay? So he felt like her ankles were swollen, so he should give her uh, more Lasix to some fluid off. So assessment, skin, her core is hot and dry and pink, lungs clinical bilaterally, at least we thought, labored, waves of increased pain, non-labored, decreased pain. Oh, someone else got to go. Okay, so there's your vital signs and all that. Okay, so she's got a temp. Something's going on. She's got a temp. SpO2 is not bad though. Look at the end title though. Damn. 
respiratory rate's really high. End tidal, that's, it could be low because of the respiratory rate, but it's not completely explainable. That's not a high enough respiratory rate to cause that much of a drop. So additional factors, uh, orthostatic vitals, we did do it. She didn't last very long. Pulse increased to 138. Uh, blood pressure didn't change, though. Uh, she became increasingly dizzy and unsteady. Um, she did confirm chills today, dizziness upon standing, continued fatigue, uh, as mentioned, since her appointment one week ago. So she had increased urination from the Bumex, she, she, but she said today she's only urinated twice. Normal bowel movement, pain's palpable, sharp reaction of pain. You can see a thorough assessment, right? She's had severe ways of faint, pain. No other findings had to tell in 12 leads normal. So what are you guys thinking? Septic. Okay. So we'll just skip that for the sake of time. Okay. So hopefully we're all thinking septic. Uh, this was our very first sepsis patient that we had. A uh, true sepsis patient that we called a sepsis alert on. It was right when we were putting our protocol in place, which we've had a protocol for uh, like seven years probably, something like that. So we were probably one of the first people in the state to do a sepsis protocol. It's been difficult to do. It's a different way of thinking because it's not sexy to treat these patients. It's not a sexy way of, um, we're, we're used to Johnny and Roy shit. If anybody doesn't know what Johnny and Roy is, that's your next training. Um, but anyways, Sepsis, okay. Sepsis essentially, that's a whole other day, but essentially it's distributive shock, okay? That's really what it is. So it's the same thing as almost like an anaphylactic shock. It's the same type of thing. You got fluid that's shifting. There's all kinds of fluid in all kinds of spaces except where it's supposed to be. You got a bunch of microclotting. Oxygen can't get to the tissues and organs like it should, okay? Lots of fluids, sometimes epi. There was sepsis. I'm going to keep on going with a couple more, okay? I know we're getting late. You guys okay with staying for a little bit more? Maybe. Okay. It's really important. Vitals, general illness. Uh, this is her still, I'm sorry. Lots of fluids. Uh, we took her to the hospital and said, hey, sound the alarms. This is really bad. She's going to crash. Uh, we got some improvement with the, uh, you can see the vitals. We improved the entitle from 14 to 23. We had her in a Trendelenburg position, slightly head elevated. Okay, we're doing everything we should. They give her a hall bed. I ain't, I'm not shitting you either. They gave her a hall bed, and we, I, I, this is my patient, said she is going to crash if you guys don't keep after her. She needs lots of fluids, blah, blah, blah. And I'm pretty persistent when I, I don't take many patients to the hospital anymore, but I don't, I don't care if I piss somebody off. I'm pretty persistent if I feel like something is going down the wrong path. Her blood pressure ended up dropping to 63 over 30. She ended up going into multiple organ dysfunction syndrome. And if you guys don't know what that is, basically what it means is her organs were not getting enough oxygen, and she started having multiple organ system failure. Okay, uh, She did survive, but she has had a host of problems ever since. Okay, Once someone goes into multiple organ dysfunction syndrome, they are going to have a ton of problems the rest of their lives. Okay, She didn't need it. She only had one kidney to begin with. Kidney is one of the first things that's going to shut down Okay, when it's not getting oxygen. So you guys can make a difference, if you, especially if you incorporate this technology. Okay, uh, Lactate and end title is inverse relationship. Okay, So as a lactate reading goes up, which is what a, a hospital will use for a marker, an end title will go down. When you start seeing an end title of 25 or less, that's usually a really good indication you can start treating aggressively, okay? Uh, it's time and time again is linked. 25 is like a magic number for linking to perfusion-related issues. The only thing I take in consideration is this lady had a fever. So the more of a fever, the more carbon dioxide production. So I'll actually look at an end title of 30 in the face of a fever, and I'll still treat that like it's a 25 or worse, okay? If they start getting below 20 down to 15 in that area, I guarantee you they will crash. It's a matter of time. Okay? The fire pump can't keep going any longer. Eventually, the systems are going to fail. Okay? So eventually, that blood pressure will crash. If you want to wait around and wait for it to happen, fine. 
but there's already something else that's pointing out that that's sticking out for you, okay? This is a supermodel. She's dead now. She had sepsis too. Okay? Doesn't have to be old people, it doesn't have to be young people, or it could be young people, it could be kids. All right? This is a fat guy in a speedo. That's all he is. Diff breather, difficulty breathing, 0632 hours. A crew gets there, she's in tripod position, she has a history of COPD. So they automatically give her a nebulizer. That's what we do, they got COPD, right? Waveforms hooked up. Uh, Capnography is hooked up. Waveforms determined to be normal. We uh, continue on our assessment. We find out that she's had a really red, swollen right arm with cellulitis. Okay. Normal waveform. We discontinue the nebulizer. Uh, she had some of a low pulse ox. We did give her a CPAP, a little bit of CPAP, which helped her. Okay. Uh, because she did have respiratory involvement with respect that sometimes patients with sepsis, which this lady was septic also they will have respiratory involvement with fluid leakage around the lungs and the alveoli. Okay, so CPAP can sometimes help with that because they'll have that atelectasis or sometimes pneumonia as well. Okay, so it was controversial at the time. We discontinued a nebulizer on a COPD patient, but she didn't, it didn't match up with the assessment. Okay. Oh, yeah. She crashed. Her blood pressure crashed also. She had a raging fever and she had an end title that was like so so. STEMIs, right sided MIs. Do you give nitro to right sided MIs? No. End title will be low on that too. When you got right ventricular dysfunction, you're going to have a low end title. Okay, it's just more, you know, right sided MIs, you should know better. Uh, but some people still try to treat it with nitro, believe it or not. Sometimes in hospitals they do it. Uh, but <clears throat> give it a chance, the nitro will cause them to crash. End title will tell you. <laughs> Guys, hopefully this was a benefit to you. Um, if you ever have any questions, you can um, email me that one. Or you can email me to my work email, uh, which Patrick can forward it to you. Or I think I have some cards.